Part 4. Corporate Power and Labor Solidarity Corporations versus the Market, or Whip Conflation Now Roderick T. Long, 2008 Defenders of the free market are often accused of being apologists for big business and shills for the corporate elite. Is this a fair charge? No and yes. Emphatically no, because corporate power and the free market are actually antithetical. Genuine competition is big business's worst nightmare. But also, in too many cases, yes, because although liberty and plutocracy cannot coexist, simultaneous advocacy of both is all too possible. First, the no. Corporations tend to fear competition because competition exerts downward pressure on prices and upward pressure on salaries. Moreover, success on the market comes with no guarantee of permanency, depending as it does on outdoing other firms at correctly figuring out how to best satisfy forever-changing consumer preferences, and that kind of vulnerability to loss is no picnic. It is no surprise, then, that throughout U.S. history, corporations have been overwhelmingly hostile to the free market. Indeed, most of the existing regulatory apparatus, including those regulations widely misperceived as restraints on corporate power, were vigorously supported, lobbied for, and in some cases even drafted by the corporate elite. Footnote. For documentation and analysis, see James Weinstein, The Corporate Ideal in the Liberal State, 1900-1918. New York, Farrar, 1976. Gabriel Kolko, The Triumph of Conservatism, A Reinterpretation of American History, 1900-1916. New York, Free, 1963. Gabriel Kolko, Railroads and Regulation, 1877-1916, Princeton, Princeton University Press, 1965, Paul Weaver, The Suicidal Corporation, How Big Business Fails America, New York, Touch Toes Simon, 1988, Butler D. Schaefer, In Restraint of Trade, The Business Campaign Against Competition, 1918-1938, Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, Bucknell University Press, 1997. For briefer accounts, see Roy A. Childs, Big Business and the Rise of American Statism, Chapter 23, pages 223 to 240 in this volume. Joseph R. Stromberg, The Political Economy of Liberal Corporatism, Individualist, May 1972, pages 2 to 11. Corporate power depends crucially on government intervention in the marketplace. Footnote. This is especially true if, as some libertarians argue, the corporate form itself, involving legal personality and limited liability, is inconsistent with free market principles. For this position, see Frank Van Dunn, Is the Corporation a Free Market Institution? The Freeman, Ideas on Liberty, 53.3, March 2003, pages 29 to 33, Foundation for Economic Education, 2003. For the other side, see Norman Berry, The Theory of the Corporation, The Freeman Ideas on Liberty, 53.3, March 2003, pages 22 to 26, Foundation for Economic Education, 2003. For the purposes of the present discussion, however, let us assume the legitimacy of the corporation. This is obvious enough in the case of the more overt forms of government favoritism, such as subsidies, bailouts, and other forms of corporate welfare, protectionist tariffs, explicit grants of monopoly privilege, and the seizing of private property for corporate use via eminent domain, as in Kilo v. New London. Footnote. See Roderick T. Long, Regulation, The Cause, Not the Cure of the Financial Crisis, Chapter 24, pages 241 to 246 in this volume. But these direct forms of pro-business intervention are supplemented by a swarm of indirect forms whose impact is arguably greater still. As I have written elsewhere, one especially useful service that the state can render the corporate elite is cartel enforcement. Price-fixing agreements are unstable on a free market, since while all parties to the agreement have a collective interest in seeing the agreement generally hold, each has an individual interest in breaking the agreement by underselling the other parties in order to win away their customers. And even if the cartel manages to maintain discipline over its own membership, the oligopolistic prices tend to attract new competitors into the market. Hence the advantage to business of state-enforced cartelization. Often this is done directly, but there are indirect ways too, such as imposing uniform quality standards that relieve firms from having to compete in quality. 
and when the quality standards are high, lower quality but cheaper competitors are priced out of the market. The ability of colossal firms to exploit economies of scale is also limited in a free market, since beyond a certain point, the benefits of size, for example, reduced transaction costs, get outweighed by diseconomies of scale, for example, calculational chaos stemming from absence of price feedback. Unless the state enables them to socialize these costs by immunizing them from competition, for example, by imposing fees, licensure requirements, capitalization requirements, and other regulatory burdens that disproportionately impact newer, poorer entrants as opposed to richer, more established firms. Nor does the list end there. Tax breaks to favored corporations represent yet another non obvious form of government intervention. There is, of course, nothing anti market about tax breaks per se, quite the contrary. But when a firm is exempted from taxes to which its competitors are subject, it becomes the beneficiary of state coercion directed against others, and to that extent owes its success to government intervention rather than market forces. Intellectual property laws also function to bolster the power of big business. Even those who accept intellectual property as a legitimate form of private property can agree that the ever expanding temporal horizon of copyright protection, along with disproportionately steep fines for violations, measures for which publishers, recording firms, software companies, and film studios have lobbied so effectively, are excessive from an individual point of view, stand in tension with the express intent of the Constitution's Patents and Copyrights Clause, and have more to do with maximizing corporate profits than with securing. A fair return to the original creators. Footnote Another disputed issue among libertarians. See, for example, Cato Unbound's Symposium, The Future of Copyright, Cato Institute, June 2008. Government favoritism also underwrites environmental irresponsibility on the part of big business. Polluters often enjoy protection against lawsuits, for example, despite the pollution's status as a violation of private property rights. Footnote Murray N. Rothbard, Law, Property Rights, and Air Pollution, Cato Journal 2.1, Spring 1982, pages 55 to 99, Cato Institute 1982. When timber companies engage in logging on public lands, the access roads are generally tax funded, thus reducing the cost of logging below its market rate. Moreover, since the loggers do not own the forests, they have little incentive to log sustainably. Footnote Mary J. Ruart, Healing Our World in an Age of Aggression, Kalamazoo, Sun Star, 2003, pages 117 to 119. In addition, inflationary monetary policies on the part of central banks also tend to benefit those businesses that receive the inflated money first in the form of loans and investments while they are still facing the old, lower prices, while those to whom the new money trickles down later, only after they have already begun facing higher prices, systematically lose out. And of course, corporations have been frequent beneficiaries of U.S. military interventions abroad, from the United Fruit Company in 1950s Guatemala to Halliburton in Iraq today. Vast corporate empires like Walmart are often either hailed or condemned, depending on the speaker's perspective, as products of the free market. But not only is Walmart a direct beneficiary of usually local government intervention in the form of such measures as eminent domain and tax breaks, but it also reaps less obvious benefits from policies of wider application. The funding of public highways through tax revenues, for example, constitutes a de facto transportation subsidy, allowing Walmart and similar chains to socialize the costs of shipping and so enabling them to compete more successfully against local businesses. The low prices we enjoy at Walmart in our capacity as consumers are thus made possible in part by our already having indirectly subsidized Walmart's operating costs in our capacity as taxpayers. Walmart also keeps its costs low by paying low salaries, but what makes those low salaries possible is the absence of more lucrative alternatives for its employees, and that fact in turn owes much to government intervention. The existence of regulations, fees, licensure requirements, etc., does not affect all market participants equally. It's much easier for wealthy, well-established companies to jump through these hoops than it is for new firms just starting up. Hence, such regulations both decrease the number of employers bidding for employees' services, thus keeping salaries low, and make it harder for the less affluent to start enterprises of their own. Footnote. 
On this latter point, see Charles W. Johnson, Scratching By, How Government Creates Poverty as We Know It, Chapter 41, pages 377 to 384 in this volume. Legal restrictions on labor organizing also make it harder for such workers to organize collectively on their own behalf. Footnote. For some of the ways in which purportedly pro-labor legislation turns out to be anti-labor in practice, see Charles W. Johnson, Free the Unions and All Political Prisoners, Rad Geek People's Daily, No Publisher, May 1st, 2004, radgeek.com. I don't mean to suggest that Walmart and similar firms owe their success solely to government privilege. Genuine entrepreneurial talent has doubtless been involved as well. But given the enormous governmental contribution to that success, it's doubtful that, in the absence of government intervention, such firms would be in anything like the position they are today. In a free market, firms would be smaller and less hierarchical, more local and more numerous, and many would probably be employee-owned. Prices would be lower and wages higher, and corporate power would be in shambles. Small wonder that big business, despite often paying lip service to free market ideals, tends to systematically oppose them in practice. So where does this idea come from that advocates of free market libertarianism must be carrying water for big business interests? Whence the pervasive conflation of corporatist plutocracy with libertarian laissez-faire? Who is responsible for promoting this confusion? There are three different groups that must shoulder their share of the blame. Note, in speaking of blame, I am not necessarily saying that the culprits have deliberately promulgated what they knew to be a confusion. In most cases, the failing is rather one of negligence, of inadequate attention to inconsistencies in their worldview. And as we'll see, these three groups have systematically reinforced one another's confusions. Culprit number one, the left. Across the spectrum from the squishiest mainstream liberal to the bomb-throwingest radical leftist, there is widespread, though not, it should be noted, universal, agreement that laissez-faire and corporate plutocracy are virtually synonymous. Footnote. Especially given that many anti-corporate libertarians identify themselves as part of the left. For example, the Alliance of the Libertarian Left. See Alliance of the Libertarian Left at all-left.net. David Corton, for example, describes advocates of unrestricted markets, private property, and individual rights as corporate libertarians who champion a globalized free market that leaves resource allocation decisions in the hands of giant corporations. Footnote, David C. Corton, When Corporations Rule the World, 2nd Edition, San Francisco, Barrett Kohler, 2001, page 77. As though these giant corporations were creatures of the free market rather than of the state. While Noam Chomsky, though savvy enough to recognize that the corporate elite are terrified of genuine free markets, in the same breath will turn around and say that we must at all costs avoid free markets, lest we unduly empower the corporate elite. Footnote Roderick T. Long, Chomsky's Augustinian Anarchism, Center for a Stateless Society, Molinari Institute, January 7, 2010 c4ss.org. Culprit number two, the right. If libertarians' left-wing opponents have conflated free markets with pro-business intervention, libertarians' right-wing opponents have done all they can to foster precisely this confusion, for there is a widespread, though again not universal, tendency for conservatives to cloak corporatist policies in free market rhetoric. This is how conservative politicians in their presumptuous Adam Smith neckties have managed to get themselves perceived, perhaps have even managed to perceive themselves, as proponents of tax cuts, spending cuts, and unhampered competition, despite endlessly raising taxes, raising spending, and promoting government business partnerships. Consider the conservative virtue term privatization, which has two distinct, indeed opposed, meanings. On one hand, it can mean returning some service or industry from the monopolistic government sector to the competitive private sector, getting government out of it. This would be the libertarian meaning. On the other hand, it can mean contracting out, i.e. granting some private firm a monopoly privilege in the provision of some service previously provided by government directly. There is nothing free market about privatization in this latter sense, since the monopoly power is merely transferred from one set of hands to another. This is corporatism, or pro-business intervention, not laissez-faire. 
To be sure, there may be competition in the bidding for such monopoly contracts, but competition to establish a legal monopoly is no more genuine market competition than voting, one last time, to establish a dictator is genuine democracy. Of these two meanings, the corporatist meaning may actually be older, dating back to fascist economic policies in Nazi Germany, but it was the libertarian meaning that was primarily intended when the term, coined independently as the reverse of nationalization, first achieved widespread usage in recent decades. Footnote, Germain Bell, Retrospectives, The Coining of Privatization and Germany's National Socialist Party. Journal of Economic Perspectives, 20.3, Summer 2006, pages 187 to 194. Bell's article unfortunately shows little sensitivity to the distinction between libertarian and corporatist senses of privatization. Yet conservatives have largely co-opted the term, turning it once again toward the corporatist sense. Similar concerns apply to that other conservative virtue term, deregulation. From a libertarian standpoint, deregulating should mean the removal of government directives and interventions from the sphere of voluntary exchange. But when a private entity is granted special governmental privileges, deregulating it amounts instead to an increase, not a decrease, in governmental intrusion into the economy. To take an example, not exactly at random, if assurances of a tax-funded bailout lead banks to make riskier loans than they otherwise would, then the banks are being made freer to take risks with the money of unconsenting taxpayers. When conservatives advocate this kind of deregulation, they are wrapping redistribution and privilege in the language of economic freedom. When conservatives market their plutocratic schemes as free market policies, can we really blame liberals and leftists for conflating the two? Well, okay, yes we can. Still, it is a mitigating factor. Culprit number three? Libertarians themselves. Alas, libertarians are not innocent here which is why the answer to my opening question as to whether it's fair to charge libertarians with being apologists for big business was no and yes rather than a simple no. If libertarians are accused of carrying water for corporate interests, that may be at least in part because, well, they so often sound like that's just what they're doing, though here, as above, there are plenty of honorable exceptions to this tendency. Consider libertarian icon Ayn Rand's description of big business as a persecuted minority. Footnote, Ayn Rand, America's Persecuted Minority, Big Business. Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, New York, Signet NAL, 1967, pages 44 to 62. In fairness to Rand, she was not entirely blind to the phenomenon of corporatism. In her article, The Roots of War, Capitalism, pages 35 to 44, for example, she condemns men with political pull who seek special advantages by government action in their own countries and special markets by government action abroad, and so acquire fortunes by government favor, which they could not have acquired on a free market. Moreover, while readers often come away from her novel Atlas Shrugged, New York, Penguin, 1999, with the vague memory that the heroine, Dagny Taggart, was fighting against evil bureaucrats who wanted to impose unfair regulations on her railroad company. In fact, Taggart's struggle is against evil bureaucrats, in league with her power-hungry brother-slash-employer, who want to give her company special favors and privileges at its competitor's expense. For an analysis of what Rand got right and wrong about corporatism, see Roderick T. Long, Toward a Libertarian Theory of Class, Social Philosophy and Policy, 15.1, 1998, pages 321 to 325, Social Philosophy and Policy Center, 1998, praxeology.net. Or the way libertarians defend our free market healthcare system against the alternative of socialized medicine, as though the healthcare system that prevails in the United States were the product of free competition rather than of systematic government intervention on behalf of insurance companies and the medical establishment at the expense of ordinary people. Footnote See Roderick T. Long, Poison as Food, Poison as Antidote, Art of the Possible Essays, No Publisher. August 28, 2008, praxeology.net. Or again, note the alacrity with which so many libertarians rush to defend Walmart and the like as heroic exemplars of the free market. 
Among such libertarians, criticisms of corporate power are routinely dismissed as anti-market ideology. Of course, such dismissiveness gets reinforced by the fact that many critics of corporate power are in the grip of anti-market ideology. Thus, when left-wing analysts complain about corporate libertarians, they're not merely confused. They're responding to a genuine tendency, even if they've to some extent misunderstood it. Kevin Carson has coined the term vulgar libertarianism for the tendency to treat the case for the free market as though it justified various unlovely features of actually existing corporatist society. Footnote. Kevin A. Carson. Vulgar Libertarianism Watch, Part 1. Mutualist Blog. Free Market Anti-Capitalism. No Publisher. January 11, 2005. Mutualist.blogspot.com. I find it preferable to talk of vulgar libertarianism rather than of vulgar libertarians, because very few libertarians are consistently vulgar. Vulgar libertarianism is a tendency that can show up to varying degrees in thinkers who have many strong anti-corporatist tendencies also. Likewise, vulgar liberalism is Carson's corresponding tendency to treat the undesirability of those features of actually existing corporatist society as though they constituted an objection to the free market. Footnote, Kevin A. Carson, Vulgar Liberalism Watch, yeah, you read it right, Mutualist Blog, Free Market Anti-Capitalism, no publisher, December 21st, 2005, online at mutualist.blogspot.com. Both tendencies conflate free markets with corporatism, but draw opposite morals. As Murray Rothbard notes, both left and right have been persistently misled by the notion that intervention by the government is ipso facto leftish and anti-business. Footnote, Murray and Rothbard, Left and Right, The Prospects for Liberty, Left and Right 1.1, Spring 1965, pages 4 to 22, Mises.org. And if many leftists tend to see dubious corporate advocacy in libertarian pronouncements, even when it's not there, so likewise, many libertarians tend not to see dubious corporate advocacy in libertarian pronouncements, even when it is there. There is an obvious tendency for vulgar libertarianism and vulgar liberalism to reinforce each other, as each takes at face value the conflation of plutocracy with free markets assumed by the other. This conflation in turn tends to bolster the power of the political establishment by rendering genuine libertarianism invisible. Those who are attracted to free markets are lured into supporting plutocracy, thus helping to prop up statism's right or corporatist wing. Those who are repelled by plutocracy are lured into opposing free markets, thus helping to prop up statism's left or social democratic wing. But as these two wings have more in common than not, the political establishment wins either way. Footnote. The relationship between big business and big government is like the relationship between church and state in the Middle Ages. It's not an entirely harmonious cooperation, since each would like to be the dominant partner, and whether the result looks more like socialism or more like fascism depends on which side is in the ascendant at the moment. But the two sides share an interest in subordinating society to the partnership. See Long, Poison. The perception that libertarians are shills for big business thus has two bad effects. First, it tends to make it harder to attract converts to libertarianism, and so hinders its success. Second, those converts it does attract may end up reinforcing corporate power through their advocacy of a muddled version of the doctrine. In the 19th century, it was far more common than it is today for libertarians to see themselves as opponents of big business. Footnote. See Roderick T. Long. They Saw It Coming, The Nineteenth-Century Libertarian Critique of Fascism. Ludwig von Mises Institute Conference on the Economics of Fascism, November 2, 2005, lewrockwell.com. The long 20th-century alliance of libertarians with conservatives against the common enemy of state socialism probably had much to do with reorienting libertarian thought toward the right, and the brief rapprochement between libertarians and the left during the 1960s foundered when the new left imploded. Footnote. John Payne. Rothbard's Time on the Left. Journal of Libertarian Studies, 19.1, Winter 2005, pages 7-24. Ludwig von Mises Institute, 2005, Mises.org. 
As a result, libertarians have been ill-placed to combat left-wing and right-wing conflation of markets with privilege, because they have not been entirely free of the conflation themselves. Happily, the left-slash-libertarian coalition is now beginning to re-emerge, and with it is emerging a new emphasis on the distinction between free markets and prevailing corporatism. Footnote. See, for example, leftlibertarian.org. No publisher, no date. In addition, many libertarians are beginning to rethink the way they present their views, and in particular their use of terminology. Take, for example, the word capitalism, which libertarians during the past century have tended to apply to the system they favor. As I've argued elsewhere, this term is somewhat problematic. Some use it to mean free markets, others to mean corporate privilege, and still others, perhaps the majority, to mean some confused amalgamation of the two. By capitalism, most people mean neither the free market simpliciter nor the prevailing neo-mercantilist system simpliciter. Rather, what most people mean by capitalism is this free market system that currently prevails in the Western world. In short, the term capitalism as generally used conceals an assumption that the prevailing system is a free market. And since the prevailing system is in fact one of government favoritism toward business, the ordinary use of the term carries with it the assumption that the free market is government favoritism toward business. Footnote, Roderick T. Long, Rothbard's Left and Right, 40 Years Later, Rothbard Memorial Lecture, 2006, Ludwig von Mises Institute, April 8, 2006, Mises.org. Hence, clinging to the term capitalism may be one of the factors reinforcing the conflation of libertarianism with corporatist advocacy. Footnote. William Gillis has likewise suggested abandoning free market in favor of freed market. See William Gillis, The Freed Market, Chapter 1, pages 19 to 20 of this volume. In any case, if libertarian advocacy is not to be misperceived, or worse yet, correctly perceived, as pro-corporate apologetics, the antithetical relationship between free markets and corporate power must be continually highlighted. Does Competition Mean War? Benjamin R. Tucker, 1888 Block quote. Your thought-provoking controversy with Herr Most suggests this question. Whether is individualism or communism more consistent with a society resting upon credit and mutual confidence? Or, to put it another way, whether is competition or cooperation the truest expression of that mutual trust and fraternal goodwill which alone can replace present forms of authority, usages, and customs as the social bond of union? The answer seems obvious enough. Competition, if it means anything at all, means war, and so far from tending to enhance the growth of mutual confidence, must generate division and hostility among men. If egoistic liberty demands competition as its necessary corollary, every man becomes a social Ishmael. The state of veiled warfare thus implied, where underhand cunning takes the place of open force, is doubtless not without its attractions to many minds, but to propose mutual confidence as its regulative principle has all the appearance of making a declaration of war in terms of peace. No, surely credit and mutual confidence, with everything thereby implied, rightly belong to an order of things where unity and good fellowship characterize all human relations, and would flourish best where cooperation finds its complete expression, viz. in communism. W. T. Horn the supposition that competition means war rests upon old notions and false phrases that have been long current, but are rapidly passing into the limbo of exploded fallacies. Competition means war only when it is in some way restricted, either in scope or intensity, that is, when it is not perfectly free competition, for then its benefits are won by one class at the expense of another, instead of by all at the expense of nature's forces. When universal and unrestricted, Competition means the most perfect peace and the truest cooperation, for then it becomes simply a test of forces resulting in their most advantageous utilization. As soon as the demand for labor begins to exceed the supply, making it an easy matter for everyone to get work at wages equal to his product, it is for the interest of all, including his immediate competitors, that the best man should win, which is another way of saying that, where freedom prevails, competition and cooperation are identical. 
For further proof and elaboration of this proposition, I refer Mr. Horn to Andrew's Science of Society and Fowler's pamphlets on cooperation. The real problem, then, is to make the demand for labor greater than the supply, and this can only be done through competition in the supply of money or use of credit. This is abundantly shown in Green's Mutual Banking and the financial writings of Proudhon and Spooner. My correspondent seems filled with the sentiment of good fellowship, but ignorant of the science thereof, and even of the fact that there is such a science. He will find this science expounded in the works already named. If, after studying and mastering these, he still should have any doubts, liberty will then try to set them at rest. Economic Calculation in the Corporate Commonwealth Kevin Carson, 2007 the general lines of Ludwig von Mises's rational calculation argument are well known. A market in factors of production is necessary for pricing production inputs so that a planner may allocate them rationally. The problem has nothing to do with either the volume of data or with agency problems. The question, rather, as Peter Klein put it, is how does the principal know what to tell the agent to do? This calculation argument can be applied not only to a state-planned economy, but also to the internal planning of the large corporation under interventionism or state capitalism. By state capitalism, I refer to the means by which, as Murray Rothbard said, our corporate state uses the coercive taxing power either to accumulate corporate capital or to lower corporate costs. In addition to cartelizing markets through regulations, enforcing artificial property rights like intellectual property, and otherwise protecting privilege against competition. Rothbard developed the economic calculation argument in just this way. He argued that the further removed the internal transfer pricing of a corporation has become from real market prices, the more internal allocation of resources was characterized by calculational chaos. Mises's calculation argument can be applied to the large corporation, both under state capitalism and to some extent in the free market, in another way not considered by Rothbard. The basic cause of calculational chaos, as Mises understood it, was the separation of entrepreneurial from technical knowledge and the attempt to make production decisions based on technical considerations alone, without regard to such entrepreneurial considerations as factor pricing. But the principle also works the other way. Production decisions based solely on input and product prices without regard to the details of production, the typical MBA practice of considering only finance and marketing while treating the production process as a black box, also result in calculational chaos. The chief focus of this article, however, is Mises's calculation argument in the light of distributed information. F. A. Hayek in The Uses of Knowledge in Society raised a new problem not the generation or source of data, but the sheer volume of data to be processed. In doing so, he is commonly understood to have opened a second front in Mises' war against state planning. But in fact, his argument was almost as damaging to Mises as to the collectivists. Mises minimized the importance of distributed information in his own criticisms of state planning. He denied any correlation between bureaucratization and large size in themselves. Bureaucracy as such was a particular rules-based approach to policymaking, in contrast to the profit-driven behavior of the entrepreneur. The private firm, therefore, was by definition exempt from the problem of bureaucracy. In so arguing, he ignored the information and coordination problems inherent in large size. The large corporation necessarily distributes the knowledge relevant to informed entrepreneurial decisions among many departments and sub-departments until the cost of aggregating that knowledge outweighs the benefits of doing so. Try as he might, Mises could not exempt the capitalist corporation from the problem of bureaucracy. One cannot define bureaucracy out of existence or overcome the problem of distributed knowledge simply by using the word entrepreneur. Mises tried to make the bureaucratic or non-bureaucratic character of an organization a simple matter of its organizational goals rather than its functioning. The motivation of the corporate employee, from the CEO down to the production worker, by definition will be profit-seeking, and his will is in harmony with that of the stockholder because he belongs to the stockholder's organization. By defining organizational goals as profit-seeking, Mises, like the neoclassicals, treated the internal workings of the organization as a black box. In treating the internal policies of the capitalist corporation as inherently profit-driven, Mises simultaneously treated the entrepreneur as an indivisible actor whose will and perception permeate the entire organization. 
Mises' entrepreneur was a brooding omnipresence, guiding the actions of every employee from CEO to janitor. He viewed the separation of ownership from control and the knowledge and agency problems resulting from it as largely non-existent. The invention of double-entry bookkeeping, which made possible the separate calculation of profit and loss in each division of an enterprise, has relieved the entrepreneur of involvement in too much detail, Mises writes in Human Action. The only thing necessary to transform every single employee of a corporation, from CEO on down, into a perfect instrument of his will, was the ability to monitor the balance sheet of any division or office and fire the functionary responsible for red ink. Mises continues, it is the system of double-entry bookkeeping that makes the functioning of the managerial system possible. Thanks to it, the entrepreneur is in a position to separate the calculation of each part of his total enterprise in such a way that he can determine the role it plays within his whole enterprise. Within this system of business calculation, each section of a firm represents an integral entity, a hypothetical independent business as it were. It is assumed that this section owns a definite part of the whole capital employed in the enterprise, that it buys from other sections and sells to them, that it has its own expenses and its own revenues, that its dealings result either in a profit or in a loss, which is imputed to its own conduct of affairs as distinguished from the result of other sections. Thus, the entrepreneur can assign to each section's management a great deal of independence. The only directive he gives to a man whom he entrusts with the management of a circumscribed job is to make as much profit as possible. An examination of the accounts shows how successful or unsuccessful the managers were in executing this directive. Every manager and sub-manager is responsible for the working of his section or subsection. His own interests impel him toward the utmost care and exertion in the conduct of his section's affairs. If he incurs losses, he will be replaced by a man whom the entrepreneur expects to be more successful, or the whole section will be discontinued. Capital Markets as Control Mechanism Mises also identified outside capital markets as a control mechanism limiting managerial discretion. Of the popular conception of stockholders as passive rentiers in the face of managerial control, he wrote, This doctrine disregards entirely the role that the capital and money market, the stock and bond exchange, which a pertinent idiom simply calls the market, plays in the direction of corporate business. In fact, the changes in the prices of stock and of corporate bonds are the means applied by the capitalists for the supreme control of the flow of capital. The price structure as determined by the speculations on the capital and money markets and on the big commodity exchanges not only decides how much capital is available for the conduct of each corporation's business, it creates a state of affairs to which the managers must adjust their operations in detail. One can hardly imagine the most hubristic of state socialist central planners taking a more optimistic view of the utopian potential of numbers crunching. Peter Klein argued that this foreshadowed Henry Manny's treatment of the mechanism by which entrepreneurs maintain control of corporate management. So long as there is a market for control of corporations, the discretion of management will be limited by the threat of hostile takeover. Although management possesses a fair degree of administrative autonomy, any significant deviation from profit maximization will lower stock prices and bring the corporation into danger of outside takeover. The question, though, is whether those making investment decisions, whether senior management allocating capital among divisions of a corporation or outside finance capitalists, even possess the information needed to assess the internal workings of firms and make appropriate decisions. How far the real-world state capitalist allocation of finance differs from Mises's picture is suggested by Robert Jackal's account in Moral Mazes of the internal workings of a corporation, especially the notorious practices of starving or milking an organization in order to inflate its apparent short-term profit. Whether an apparent profit is sustainable or an illusory side effect of eating the seed corn is often a judgment best made by those directly involved in production. The purely money calculations of those at the top do not suffice for a valid assessment of such questions. One big problem with Mises's model of entrepreneurial central planning by double-entry bookkeeping is this. It is often the irrational constraints imposed from above that result in red ink at lower levels. But those at the top of the hierarchy refuse to acknowledge the double bind they put their subordinates in. Plausible deniability, the downward flow of responsibility and upward flow of credit, and the practice of shooting the messenger for bad news are what lubricate the wheels of any large organization. 
As for outside investors, participants in the capital markets are even further removed than management from the data needed to evaluate the efficiency of factor use within the black box. In practice, hostile takeovers tend to gravitate toward firms with lower debt loads and apparently low short-term profit margins. The corporate raiders are more likely to smell blood when there is the possibility of loading up an acquisition with new debt and stripping it of assets for short-term returns. The best way to avoid a hostile takeover, on the other hand, is to load an organization with debt and inflate the short-term returns by milking. Another problem from the perspective of those at the top is determining the significance of red or black ink. How does the large-scale investor distinguish losses caused by senior management's gaming of the system in its own interest at the expense of the productivity of the organization from losses occurring as normal effects of the business cycle? Mises, of all people, who rejected the neoclassical's econometric approach precisely because the variables were too complex to control for, should have anticipated such difficulties. Management's gaming might well be a purely defensive response to structural incentives, a way of deflecting pressure from those above, whose only concern is to maximize apparent profits without regard to how short-term savings might result in long-term loss. The practices of starving and milking organizations that Jackal made so much of, deferring needed maintenance costs, letting plant and equipment run down, and the like in order to inflate the quarterly balance sheet, resulted from just such pressure, as irrational as the pressures Soviet enterprise managers faced from Gosplin. Shared Culture the problem is complicated when the same organizational culture, determined by the needs of the managerial system itself, is shared by all corporations in a state-induced oligopoly industry, so that the same pattern of red ink appears industry-wide. It's complicated still further when the general atmosphere of state capitalism enables the corporations in a cartelized industry to operate in the black despite excessive size and dysfunctional internal culture. It becomes impossible to make a valid assessment of why the corporation is profitable at all. Does the black ink result from efficiency or from some degree of protection against the competitive penalty for inefficiency? If the decisions of MBA types to engage in asset stripping and milking in the interest of short-term profitability result in long-term harm to the health of the enterprise, they are more apt to be reinforced than censured by investors and higher-ups. After all, they acted according to the conventional wisdom in the big MBA handbook, so it couldn't have been that that caused them to go in the tank. It must have been sunspots or something. In fact, the financial community sometimes censures transgressions against the norms of corporate culture, even when they are quite successful by conventional measures. Costco's stock fell in value despite the company's having outperformed Walmart in profit in response to adverse publicity in the business community about its above-average wages. Deutsche Bank analyst Bill Dreyer snidely remarked, At Costco, it's better to be an employee or a customer than a shareholder. Nevertheless, in the world of faith-based investment, Walmart remains the darling of the street, which, like Walmart and many other companies, believes that shareholders are best served if employers do all they can to hold down costs, including the cost of labor. Footnote. Stanley Holmes and Wendy Zellner. The Costco way. Higher wages mean higher profits, but try telling Wall Street. Bloomberg Business Week. Bloomberg LLP. April 12, 2004 businessweek.com. On the other hand, management may be handsomely rewarded for running a corporation into the ground, so long as it is perceived to be doing everything right according to the norms of corporate culture. In a New York Times story that Dig aptly titled, Home Depot CEO Gets 210 Million Severance for Sucking at Job, it was reported that departing Home Depot CEO Robert Nardelli received an enormous severance package despite abysmal performance. It's a good thing he didn't raise employee wages too high, though, or he'd be eating in a soup kitchen. As you might expect, the usual suspects stepped in to defend Nardelli's honor. An Alan Murray article at the Wall Street Journal noted that he had more than doubled earnings. But Tom Bloomer of BusyBlog, whose sources for obvious reasons prefer to remain anonymous, pointed out some inconvenient facts about how Nardelli achieved those increased earnings. His consolidation of purchasing and many other functions to Atlanta from several regions caused buyers to lose touch with their vendors. Firing knowledgeable and experienced people in favor of uninformed newbies and part-timers greatly reduced payroll and benefits costs, but has eventually driven customers away and given the company a richly deserved reputation for mediocre service. 
Nardelli and his minions played every accounting, acquisition, and quick-fix angle they could to keep the numbers looking good while letting the business deteriorate. In a follow-up comment directed to me personally, Bloomer provided this additional bit of information. I have since learned that Nardelli, in the last months before he walked, took the entire purchasing function out of Atlanta and moved it to India, of all the things to pick for foreign outsourcing. I am told that out of touch doesn't even begin to describe how bad it is now between HD stores and purchasing, and between HD purchasing and suppliers. Not only is there a language dialect barrier, but the purchasing people in India don't know the language of American hardware, or even what half the stuff the stores and suppliers are describing even is. I am told that an incredible amount of time, money, and energy is being wasted, all in the name of what was in all likelihood a bonus-driven goal for cutting headcount and making G and A, general and administrative, expenses look low. Quote, look, because the expenses have been pushed down to the stores and suppliers. More than one observer has remarked on the similarity, in their distorting effects, of the incentives within the Soviet state planning system and the Western corporate economy. We already noted the systemic pressure to create the illusion of short-term profit by undermining long-term productivity. Consider Hayek's prediction of the uneven development, irrationality, and misallocation of resources within a planned economy. There is no reason to expect that production would stop, or that the authorities would find difficulty in using all the available resources somehow, or even that output would be permanently lower than it had been before planning started. We should expect the excessive development of some lines of production at the expense of others, and the use of methods which are inappropriate under the circumstances. We should expect to find overdevelopment of some industries at a cost which was not justified by the importance of their increased output, and see unchecked the ambition of the engineer to apply the latest development elsewhere, without considering whether they were economically suited in that situation. In many cases, the use of the latest methods of production, which could not have been applied without central planning, would then be a symptom of a misuse of resources rather than a proof of success. Footnote. Socialist Calculation 2. The State of the Debate. Individualism and Economic Order. Chicago. University of Chicago Press, 1949. Page 150. Mises.org. As an example, he cites, the excellence, from a technological point of view, of some parts of the Russian industrial equipment, which often strikes the casual observer and which is commonly regarded as evidence of success. To anyone observing the uneven development of the corporate economy under state capitalism, this should inspire a sense of deja vu. Entire categories of goods and production methods have been developed at enormous expense, either within military industry or by state-subsidized R&D in the civilian economy, without regard to cost. Subsidies to capital accumulation, R&D, and technical education radically distort the forms taken by production. On these points, see David Noble's works, Forces of Production and America by Design. Blockbuster factories and economic centralization become artificially profitable, thanks to the interstate highway system and other means of externalizing distribution costs. Pervasive Irrationality It also describes quite well the environment of pervasive irrationality within the large corporation, management featherbedding and self-dealing, cost-cutting measures that decimate productive resources while leaving management's petty empires intact, and the tendency to extend bureaucratic domain while cutting maintenance and support for existing obligations. Management's allocation of resources no doubt creates use value of a sort, but with no reliable way to assess opportunity cost or determine whether the benefit was worth it. A good example is a hospital, part of a corporate chain, that I've had occasion to observe firsthand. Management justifies repeated downsizings of nurses and technicians as cost-cutting measures, despite increased costs from errors, falls, and MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, infections, that exceed the alleged savings. Of course, the cost-cutting justification for downsizing direct caregivers doesn't extend to the patronage network of staff RNs attached to the nursing office. Meanwhile, management pours money into ill-considered capital projects, like remodeling jobs that actually make wards less functional, or the extremely expensive new ACE unit that they never opened because it was so badly designed. An expensive surgical robot, purchased mainly for prestige value, does nothing that couldn't be accomplished by scrubbing in an extra nurse. But the management team is hardly likely to face any negative consequences when the region's three other large hospitals are run exactly the same way. 
Such pathologies, obviously, are not the result of the free market. That is not to say, of course, that bigness as such would not produce inefficiency costs in some firms that might exist under laissez-faire. The calculation problem, in the broad sense that includes Hayekian information problems, may or may not exist to some extent in the private corporation in a free market. But the boundary between market and hierarchy would be set by the point at which the benefits of size cease to outweigh the costs of such calculation problems. The inefficiencies of large size and hierarchy may be a matter of degree, but, as Ronald Coase said, the market would determine whether the inefficiencies are worth it. The problem is that the state, by artificially reducing the costs of large size and constraining the competitive ill effects of calculation problems, promotes larger size than would be the case in a free market, and with it calculation problems to a pathological extent. The state promotes inefficiencies of large size and hierarchy past the point at which they cease to be worth it, from a standpoint of net social efficiency, because those receiving the benefits of large size are not the same parties who pay the costs of inefficiency. The solution is to eliminate the state policies that have created the situation and allow the market to punish inefficiency. To get there, though, some libertarians need to re-examine their unquestioned sympathies for big business as an oppressed minority, and remember that they're supposed to be defending free markets, not the winners under the current statist economy. Big Business and the Rise of American Statism Roy A. Childs, Jr., 1971 the purpose of this particular essay is simply to apply some of the principles of libertarianism to an interpretation of events in a very special and important period of human history. I have attempted to give a straightforward summary of new left revisionist findings in one area of domestic history, the antitrust movement and progressive era. But I have done so not as a new leftist, not as a historian proper, but as a libertarian, that is, a social philosopher of a specific school. In doing this summary, I have two interrelated purposes. First, to show objectivists and libertarians that certain of their beliefs in history are wrong and need to be revised under the impact of new evidence, and simultaneously, to illustrate to them a specific means of approaching historical problems, to identify one cause of the growth of American statism, and to indicate a new way of looking at history. Secondly, my purpose is to show new left radicals that far from undermining the position of laissez-faire capitalism, as opposed to what they call state capitalism, a system of government controls which is not yet socialism in the classic sense, their historical discoveries actually support the case for a totally free market. Then, too, I wish to illustrate how a libertarian would respond to the problems raised by new left historians. Finally, I wish implicitly to apply Occam's razor by showing that there is a simpler explanation of events than that so often colored with Marxist theory. Without exception, Marxist postulates are not necessary to explain the facts of reality. Conflicting Schools of Thought In historiography, different schools of thought exist in much the same way and for the same reason as in many other fields. And in history, as in those other fields, different interpretations, no matter how far removed from reality, tend to go on forever, oblivious to new evidence and theories. In his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, Thomas Kuhn shows in the physical sciences how an existing paradigm of scientific explanation tends to ignore new evidence and theories, being overthrown only when a. the puzzles and problems generated by a false paradigm pile up to an increasingly obvious extent so that an ever wider range of material cannot be integrated into the paradigm and an ever-growing number of problems cannot be solved, and b. there arises on the scene a new paradigm to replace the old. In history, perhaps more than in most other fields, the criteria of truth have not been sufficiently developed, resulting in a greater number of schools of thought that tend to rise and fall in influence more because of political and cultural factors than because of epistemological factors. The result also has been that in history, there are a number of competing paradigms to explain different sets of events, all connected to specific political views. In this essay, I shall consider three of them, the Marxist view, the conservative view, and the liberal view. I shall examine how these paradigms function with reference to one major area of American history, the progressive era, and with respect to one major issue, the roots of government regulation of the economy, particularly through the antitrust laws and the Federal Reserve System. Other incidents will also be mentioned, but this issue will be the focus. Among these various schools, nearly everyone agrees on the putative facts of American history. Disagreements arise over frameworks of interpretation and over evaluation. 
The Marxists, liberals, and conservatives all agree that in the economic history of America in the 19th century, the facts were roughly as follows. After mid-century, industrialization proceeded apace in America as a consequence of the laissez-faire policies pursued by the United States government, resulting in increased centralization and concentration of economic power. According to the liberal, in the 19th century, there was an individualistic social system in the United States, which, when left unchecked, led inevitably to the strong using the forces of a free market to smash and subdue the weak by building gigantic, monopolistic, industrial enterprises which dominated and controlled the life of the nation. Then, as this centralization proceeded to snowball, the public awoke to its impeding subjugation at the hands of these monopolistic businessmen. The public was stirred by the injustice of it all and demanded reform, whereupon altruistic and far-seeing politicians moved quickly to mash the monopolists with antitrust laws and other regulations of the economy on behalf of the ever-suffering little man who was saved thereby from certain doom. Thus did the American government squash the greedy monopolists and restore competition, equality of opportunity, and the like, which was perishing in the unregulated laissez-faire free market economy. Thus did the American state act to save both freedom and capitalism. The Marxists also hold that there was in fact a trend toward centralization of the economy at the end of the last century, and that this was inherent in the nature of capitalism as an economic system. Some modern, more sophisticated Marxists maintained, on the contrary, that historically the state was always involved in the so-called capitalistic economy. Different Marxists see the movement towards state regulation of the economy in different ways. One group basically sees state regulation as a means of prolonging the collapse of the capitalistic system, a means which they see as inherently unstable. They see regulation as an attempt by the ruling class to deal with the inner contradictions of capitalism. Another group, more sophisticated, sees the movement towards state regulation as a means of hastening the cartelization and monopolization of the economy under the hands of the ruling class. The conservative holds, like the liberal, that there was indeed such a golden age of individualism when the economy was almost completely free of government controls. But far from being evil, such a society was near utopian in their eyes. But the government intervened and threw things out of kilter. The consequence was that the public began to clamor for regulation in order to rectify things that were either not injustices at all or were injustices imposed by initial state actions. The antitrust laws and other acts of state interference, by this view, were the result. But far from seeing the key large industrialists and bankers as monopolistic monsters, the conservatives defended them as heroic innovators who were the victims of misguided or power-lusting progressives who used big businessmen as scapegoats and sacrifices on the altar of the public good. All three of the major schools of interpretation of this crucial era in American history hold two premises in common. A, that the trend in economic organization at the end of the 19th century was in fact towards growing centralization of economic power, and B, that this trend was an outcome of the processes of the free market. Only the Marxists, and then only a portion of them, take issue with the additional premise that the actions of state regulation were anti-big business in motivation, purpose, and results. And both the conservatives and the liberals see a sharp break between the ideas and men involved in the progressive movement and those of key big business and financial leaders. Marxists disagree with many of these views, but hold the premise that the regulatory movement itself was an outgrowth of the capitalist economy. The Marxists, of course, smuggle in specifically non-historical conclusions and premises based on their wider ideological frame of reference, the most prominent being the idea of necessity applied to historical events. Although there are many arguments and disputes between adherents of the various schools, none of the schools has disputed the fundamental historical premise that the dominant trend at the end of the last century was toward increasing centralization of the economy, or the fundamental economic premise that this alleged increase was the result of the operations of a laissez-faire free market system. Yet there are certain flaws in all three interpretations, flaws that are both historical and theoretical, flaws that make any of the interpretations inadequate, necessitating a new explanation. Although it is not possible here to argue in depth against the three interpretations, brief reasons for their inadequacy can be given. Aside from the enormous disputes in economics over questions such as whether or not the capitalistic system inherently leads toward concentration and centralization of economic power in the hands of a few, we can respond to the Marxists as well as to others by directing our attention to the premise that there was in fact economic centralization at the turn of the century. 
In confronting the liberals, once more we can begin by pointing to the fact that there has been much more centralization since the progressive era than before, and that the function, if not the alleged purpose of the antitrust and other regulatory laws, has been to increase, rather than decrease, such centralization. Since the conservatives already question, on grounds of economic theory, the premise that the concentration of economic power results inevitably from a free market system, we must question them as to why they believe that a. a free market actually existed during the period in question, and b. how then such centralization of economic power resulted from this supposed free market. Aside from all the economic arguments, let us look at the period in question to see if any of the schools presented hold up in any measure or degree. The Roots of Regulation In fact and in history, the entire thesis of all three schools is botched from beginning to end. The interpretations of the Marxists, the liberals, and the conservatives are a tissue of lies. As Gabriel Coco demonstrates in his masterly The Triumph of Conservatism and in Railroads and Regulation, the dominant trend in the last three decades of the 19th century and the first two of the 20th was not towards increasing centralization, but rather, despite the growing number of mergers and the growth in the overall size of many corporations, toward growing competition. Competition was unacceptable to many key business and financial leaders, and the merger movement was to a large extent a reflection of voluntary, unsuccessful business efforts to bring irresistible trends under control. As new competitors sprang up, and as economic power was diffused throughout an expanding nation, it became apparent to many important businessmen that only the national government could control and stabilize the economy. Ironically, contrary to the consensus of historians, it was not the existence of monopoly which caused the federal government to intervene in the economy, but the lack of it. Footnote. Gabriel Kolko, The Triumph of Conservatism, A Reinterpretation of American History, 1900 to 1916. Chicago, Quadrangle, 1967, pages 4 to 5. While Kolko does not consider the causes and context of the economic crises which faced businessmen from the 1870s on, we can at least summarize some of the more relevant aspects here. The enormous role played by the state in American history has not yet been fully investigated by anyone. Those focusing on the role of the federal government in regulating the economy often neglect to mention the fact that America's ostensive federalist system means that the historian concerned with the issue of regulation must look to the various state governments as well. What he will find already has been suggested by a growing number of historians, that nearly every federal program was pioneered by a number of state governments, including subsidies, land grants, and regulations of the antitrust variety. Furthermore, often neglected in these accounts is the fact that the real process of centralization of the economy came not during the Progressive Era, but rather, initially, during the Civil War, with its immense alliance between the state and business, at least in the more industrialized North. Indeed, such key figures in the Progressive Era as J.P. Morgan got their starts in alliances with the government of the North in the Civil War. The Civil War also saw the greatest inflationary expansion of the monetary supply and greatest land grants to the railroads in American history. These and other related facts mean that an enormous amount of economic malinvestment occurred during and immediately after the Civil War, and the result was that a process of liquidation of malinvestment took place, a depression in the 1870s. It was this process of inflation caused by the banking and credit system spurred by the government and followed by depressions that led the businessmen and financial leaders to seek stabilizing elements from the 1870s on. One of the basic results of this process of liquidation, of course, was a growth in competition. The thesis of the Colco books is that the trend was towards growing competition in the United States before the federal government intervened, and that various big businessmen in different fields found themselves unable to cope with this trend by private economic means. Facing falling profits and diffusion of economic power, those businessmen then turned to the state to regulate the economy on their behalf. What Kalko and his fellow revisionist James Weinstein, The Corporate Ideal in the Liberal State, 1900 to 1918, maintain, is that business and financial leaders did not merely react to these situations with concrete proposals for regulations, but with ever the more sophisticated development of a comprehensive ideology which embraced both foreign and domestic policy. Weinstein in particular links up the process of businessmen turning to the state for favors in response to problems which they faced and the modern corporate liberal system.
He maintains that the ideology now dominant in the U.S. had been worked out for the most part by the end of the First World War, not during the New Deal, as is commonly held, and that the ideal of a liberal corporate social order was developed consciously and purposefully by those who then, as now, enjoyed supremacy in the United States. The more sophisticated leaders of America's largest corporations and financial institutions. Footnote. James Weinstein, The Corporate Ideal in the Liberal State, 1900 to 1918, Boston, Beacon, 1968, Chapter 9. In examining this thesis, I shall focus predominantly on the activities of the National Civics Federation, a group of big businessmen that was the primary ideological force behind many reforms. Since the basic pattern of regulation was first established in the case of the railroads, a glance at this industry will set the basis for an examination of the others. American industry as a whole was intensely competitive in the period from 1875 on. Many industries, including the railroads, had overexpanded and were facing a squeeze on profits. American history contains the myth that the railroads faced practically no competition at all during this period, that freight rates constantly rose, pinching every last penny out of the shippers, especially the farmers, and bleeding them to death. Historian Kolko shows that, contrary to the common view, railroad freight rates, taken as a whole, declined almost continuously over the period from 1877 to 1916, and although consolidation of railroads proceeded apace, this phenomenon never affected the long-term decline of rates or the ultimately competitive nature of much of the industry. In their desire to establish stability and control over rates and competition, the railroads often resorted to voluntary cooperative efforts. When these efforts failed, as they inevitably did, the railroad men turned to political solutions to stabilize their increasingly chaotic industry. They advocated measures designed to bring under control those railroads within their own ranks that refused to conform to voluntary compacts. From the beginning of the 20th century until at least the initiation of World War I, the railroad industry resorted primarily to political alternatives and gave up the abortive efforts to put its own house in order by relying on voluntary cooperation. Insofar as the railroad men did think about the larger theoretical implications of centralized federal regulation, they rejected the entire notion of laissez-faire, and most railroad leaders increasingly relied on a Hamiltonian conception of the national government. Footnote, Gabriel Kalko, Railroads and Regulation, Princeton, Princeton University Press, 1965, pages 3 to 5. The two major means used by competitors to cut into each other's markets were rate wars, price cutting, and rebates. The aim of business leaders was to stop these. Their major unsuccessful tool was the pool, which was continuously broken up by competitive factors. Footnote, See both Kalko books for factual proof of this. Weinstein does not take this fact into account in his book, and thus underestimates this as a motivating force in the actions and beliefs of businessmen. For a theoretical explanation, see Murray and Rothbard, Man, Economy, and State with Power and Market. Auburn, Alabama, Mises, 2009, pages 636 to 661, Chapter 10, Section 2, Cartels and Their Consequences. The first serious pooling effort in the East, sponsored by the New York Central, had been tried as early as 1874 by Vanderbilt. The pool lasted for six months. In September 1876, a Southwestern Railroad Association was formed by seven major companies in an attempt to voluntarily enforce a pool. It didn't work and collapsed in early 1878. Soon it became obvious to most industrial leaders that the pooling system was ineffective. In 1876, the first significant federal regulatory bill was introduced into the House by J.R. Hopkins of Pittsburgh. Drawn up by the attorney for the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad, it died in committee. By 1879, there was a general unanimity among pool executives that, without government sanctions, the railroads would never maintain or stabilize rates. Footnote, Calco, Railroads, page 26. By 1880, the railroads were in serious trouble. The main threat was identified as cutthroat competition. Far from pushing the economy toward greater centralization, economic forces indicated that centralization was inefficient and unstable. The push was towards decentralization, and smaller railroads often found themselves much less threatened by economic turns of events than the older, more established, and larger business concerns. 
Thus, the Marxist model finds itself seriously in jeopardy in this instance. For the smaller forms and railroads throughout the crises of the 1870s and 1880s often were found to be making larger profits on capital invested than the giant businesses. Furthermore, much of the concentration of economic power which was apparent during the 1870s and on was the result of massive state aid immediately before, during, and after the Civil War, not the result of free market forces. Much of the capital accumulation, particularly in the cases of the railroads and banks, was accomplished by means of government regulation and aid, not by free trade on a free market. Also, the liberal and conservative models which stress the supposed fact that there was growing centralization in the economy and that competition either lessened or became less intense are both shaken by historical facts. And we already have seen that it was the railroad leaders faced with seemingly insurmountable problems who initiated the drive for federal government regulation of their industry. Rate wars during 1881 pushed freight rates down 50% between July and October alone. Between 1882 and 1886, freight rates declined for the nation as a whole by 20%. Railroads were increasingly talking about regulation with a certain spark of interest. Chauncey Depew, attorney for the New York Central, had become convinced of the Regulatory Commission's necessity for the protection of both the public and the railroads. Footnote. Calco, Railroads, page 17. He soon converted William H. Vanderbilt to his position. Footnote. The twin facts here that Vanderbilt needed converting and that he had other options open to him should by themselves put to rest the more simplistic Marxist theories of class consciousness, awareness of interests, and relationships to the means of production. Agitation for regulation to ease competitive pains increased, and in 1887, the Interstate Commerce Act was passed. According to the Railway Review, an organ of the railroad, it was only a first step. The act was not enough, and it did not stop either the rate wars or rebates. So early in 1889, during a prolonged rate war, J.P. Morgan summoned presidents of major railroads to New York to find ways to maintain rates and enforce the act, but this too was a failure. The larger railroads were harmed most by this competition. The smaller railroads were in many cases more prosperous than in the early 1880s. Morgan weakened rather than strengthened many of his roads, and on them services and safety often declined. Many of Morgan's lines were overexpanded into areas where competition was already too great. Footnote. Calco, Railroads, pages 65 to 66. Competition again increased. The larger roads then led the fight for further regulation, seeking more power for the Interstate Commerce Commission, ICC. In 1891, the president of a Midwestern railroad advocated that the entire matter of setting rates be turned over to the ICC. An ICC poll taken in 1892 of 15 railroads showed that 14 of them favored legalized pooling under commission control. Another important businessman, A. A. Walker, who zipped back and forth between business and government agencies, said that railroad men had had enough of competition. The phrase free competition sounds well enough as a universal regulator, he said, but it regulates by the knife. Footnote. Calco. Railroads. Page 74. In 1906, the Hepburn Act was passed, also with business backing. The railroad magnate Cassatt spoke out as a major proponent of the act and said that he had long endorsed federal rate regulation. Andrew Carnegie, too, popped up to endorse the act. George W. Perkins, an important Morgan associate, wrote his boss that the act is going to work out for the ultimate and great good of the railroad. But such controls were not enough for some big businessmen. Thus, E.P. Ripley, the president of the Santa Fe, suggested what amounted to a federal reserve system for the railroads, cheerfully declaring that such a system would do away with the enormous waste of the competitive system and permit businesses to follow the line of least resistance, a chant later taken up by Mussolini. In any case, we have seen that a. The trend was not towards centralization at the close of the 19th century. Rather, the liquidation of previous malinvestment fostered by state action and bank-led inflation worked against the bigger businesses in favor of the smaller, less overextended businesses. B. 
There was, in the case of the railroads anyway, no sharp dichotomy or antagonism between big businessmen and the progressive movement's thrust for regulation. And C, the purpose of the regulations, as seen by key business leaders, was not to fight the growth of monopoly and centralization, but to foster it. The culmination of this big business sponsored reform of the economic system is actually today's system. The new system took effect immediately during World War I when railroads gleefully handed over control to the government in exchange for guaranteed rate increases and guaranteed profits, something continued under the Transportation Act of 1920. The consequences, of course, are still making themselves felt, as in 1971, when the Pennsylvania Railroad, having cut itself off from the market and from market calculation nearly entirely, was found to be in a state of economic chaos. It declared bankruptcy and later was rescued in part by the state. Regulation comes to the rest of the economy. Having illustrated my basic thesis through a case study of the origins of regulation in the railroad industry, I shall now look at the rest of the American economy in this period and examine, however briefly, the role that big business had in pushing through acts of state regulation. I should also mention, at least in passing, big businessmen not only had a particularly important effect in pushing through domestic regulation, but they fostered interventionism in foreign policy as well. What was common to both spheres was the fact that the acts of state intervention and monetary expansion by the state-manipulated banking system had precipitated depressions and recessions from the 1870s through the 1890s. The common response of businessmen, particularly big businessmen, the leaders in various fields, was to promote further state regulation and aid as a solution to the problems caused by the depressions. In particular vogue at the time, in vogue today as a matter of fact, was the notion that continued American prosperity required, as a necessary condition, expanded markets for American goods and manufactured items. This led businessmen to seek markets in foreign lands through various routes, having fulfilled their manifest destiny at home. Domestically, however, the immediate result was much more obvious. From about 1875 on, many corporations, wishing to be large and dominant in their field, overexpanded and overcapitalized. Mediocre entrepreneurship, administrative difficulties, and increasing competition cut deeply into the markets and profits of many giants. Mergers often were tried, as in the railroad industry, but the larger mergers brought neither great profits nor less competition. As Colco states, quite the opposite occurred. There was more competition, and profits, if anything, declined. A survey of 10 mergers showed, for instance, that the companies earned an average of 65% of their pre-consolidation profits after consolidation. Over-centralization inhibited their flexibility of action, and hence their ability to respond to changing market conditions. In short, things were not as bad for other industries as for the railroads. They were often worse. In the steel industry, the price of most steel goods declined more or less regularly until 1895, and even though prices rose somewhat thereafter, there was considerable insecurity about what other competitors might choose to do next. A merger of many corporations in 1901, based on collaboration between Morgan and Carnegie, resulted in the formation of U.S. Steel. Yet U.S. Steel's profit margin declined over 50% between 1902 and 1904. In its first two decades of existence, U.S. Steel held a continually shrinking share of the market. Due to technological conservatism and inflexible leadership, the company became increasingly costly and inefficient. Voluntary efforts at control failed. U.S. Steel turned to politics. In the oil industry, where Standard Oil was dominant, the same situation existed. In 1899, there were 67 petroleum refiners in the U.S. Within 10 years, the number had grown to 147 refiners. In the telephone industry, things were in a similar shape. From its foundation in 1877 until 1894, Bell Telephone, AT&T, had a virtual monopoly in the industry based on its control of almost all patents. Footnote. It is instructive to note that most of these patents were illegitimate according to libertarian ownership theories, since many other men had independently discovered the telephone and subsequent items besides Bell and the AT&T group, yet they were coercively restrained from enjoying the product of such creativity. 
On the illegitimacy of such patent restriction, see Rothbard, pages 745 to 754, Chapter 10, Section 7, Patents and Copyrights. In 1894, many of the patents expired. Bell immediately adopted a policy of harassing the host of aspiring competitors by suing them. Twenty-seven suits were instituted in 1894 to 1895 alone for allegedly infringing Bell patents. Footnote, Colco, Triumph, pages 30 to 39. But such efforts to stifle competition failed. By 1902, there were 9,100 independent telephone systems. By 1907, there were 22,000. Most had rates lower than AT&T. In the meatpacking industry, too, the large packers felt threatened by increasing competition. Their efforts at control failed. Similar diffusion of economic power was the case in other fields, such as banking, where the power of the eastern financiers was being seriously eroded by Midwestern competitors. This, then, was the basic context of big business. These were the problems that it faced. How did it react? Almost unanimously, it turned to the power of the state to get what it could not get by voluntary means. Big business acted not only through concrete political pressure, but by engaging in large-scale, long-run ideological propaganda, or education, aimed at getting different sections of the American society united behind statism in principle and practice. Let us look at some of the activities of the major organizational tool of big business, the National Civics Federation. The NCF was actually a reincarnation of Hamiltonian views on the relation of the state to business. Primarily an organization of big businessmen, it pushed for the tactical and theoretical alliance of business and government, a primitive version of the modern business-government partnership. Contrary to the consensus of many conservatives, it was not ideological innocence that led them to create a statist economic order. They knew what they were doing and constantly said so. The working partnership of business and government was the result of the conscious activities of organizations such as the NCF, created in 1900, coincident with the birth of what is called the Progressive Movement, to fight with increasing and sustained vigor against what it considered to be its twin enemies, the socialists and radicals among workers and middle-class reformers, and the anarchists among the businessmen, as the NCF characterized the National Association of Manufacturers. The smaller businessmen, who constituted the NAM, formed an opposition to the new liberalism that developed through cooperation between political leaders such as Theodore Roosevelt, William H. Taft, and Woodrow Wilson, and the financial and corporate leaders in the NCF and other similar organizations. The NCF, before World War I, was the most important single organization of the socially conscious big businessmen and their academic and political theorists. The NCF took the lead in educating the businessmen to the changing needs in political economy, which accompanied the changing nature of America's business system. Footnote, Weinstein, page 82. The early leaders of the NCF were such big business leaders as Marcus A. Hanna, utilities magnate Samuel B. Insull, Chicago banker Franklin McVeigh, later Secretary of the Treasury, Charles Francis Adams, and several partners in J.P. Morgan & Company. The largest contributor to the group was Andrew Carnegie. Other important members of the executive committee included George W. Perkins, Albert H. Gary, a Morgan associate and a head of U.S. Steel after Carnegie, Cyrus McCormick, Theodore N. Vail, president of AT&T, and George Cortelyou, head of Consolidated Gas. The NCF sponsored legislation to promote the formation of public utilities, a special privilege monopoly granted by the state, reserving an area of production to one company. Issuing a report on public ownership of public utilities, the NCF established a general framework for regulatory laws, stating that utilities should be conducted by legalized independent commissions. Of such regulation, one businessman wrote another, Twenty-five years ago, we would have regarded it as a species of socialism. But seeing that the railroads were both submitting to and apparently profiting from regulation, the NCF's self-appointed job of educating municipal utilities corporations became much easier. Regulation in general, far from coming against the wishes of the regulated interests, was openly welcomed by them in nearly every case. 
As Upton Sinclair said of the meat industry, which he is given credit for having tamed, the federal inspection of meat was historically established at the packer's request. It is maintained and paid for by the people of the United States for the benefit of the packers. Footnote, Calco, Triumph, page 103. However, one interesting fact comes in here to refute the Marxist theory further. For the Marxists hold that there are fundamentally two opposing interests which clash in history, the capitalists and the workers. But what we have seen, essentially, is that the interests, using the word in a journalistic sense, of neither the capitalists nor the workers, so-called, were uniform or clear-cut. The interests of the larger capitalists seemed to coincide, as they saw it, and were clearly opposed to the interests of the smaller capitalists. However, there were conflicts among the big capitalists, such as between the Morgan and Rockefeller interests during the 1900s, as illustrated in the regimes of Roosevelt and Taft. The larger capitalists saw regulation as being in their interest, and competition as opposed to it. With the smaller businessmen, the situation was reversed. The workers for the larger businesses also may have temporarily gained at the expense of others through slight wage increases caused by restrictions on production. The situation is made even more complicated when we remember that the Marxist belief is that one's relationship to the means of production determines one's interests and hence, apparently, one's ideas. Yet people with basically the same relationship often had different interests and ideas. If this in turn is explained by a Marxist in terms of mystification, an illuminating explanation in a libertarian context, then mystification itself is left to be explained. For if one's ideas and interests are an automatic function of the economic system and one's relationship to the means of production, how can mystification arise at all? In any case, congressional hearings during the administration of Theodore Roosevelt revealed that the big Chicago Packers wanted more meat inspection both to bring the small Packers under control and to aid them in their position in the export trade. Formally representing the large Chicago Packers, Thomas E. Wilson publicly announced, We are now and have always been in favor of the extension of the inspection. Footnote, Colco, Triumph, page 103. In both word and deed, American businessmen sought to replace the last remnants of laissez-faire in the United States with government regulation for their own benefit. Speaking at Columbia University in February 1908, George W. Perkins, a Morgan associate, said that the corporation must welcome federal supervision administered by practical businessmen. Footnote, Colco, Triumph, page 129. As early as 1908, Andrew Carnegie and Ingalls had suggested to the NCF that it push for an American version of the British Board of Trade, which would have the power to judge mergers and other industrial actions. As Carnegie put it, this had been found sufficient in other countries and will be so with us. We must have our industrial as we have a judicial Supreme Court. Footnote, Weinstein, page 180. Carnegie also endorsed government actions to end ruinous competition. It always comes back to me that government control, and that alone, will properly solve the problem. There is nothing alarming in this. Capital is perfectly safe in the gas company, although it is under court control. So will all capital be, although under government control. Footnote, Colco, Triumph, page 180. AT&T, controlled by J.P. Morgan as of 1907, also sought regulation. The company got what it wanted in 1910, when telephones were placed under the jurisdiction of the ICC and rate wars became a thing of the past. President T.N. Vale of AT&T said, We believe in and were the first to advocate governmental control and regulation of public utilities. By June 1911, Albert H. Gary of U.S. Steel appeared before a congressional committee and announced to astonished members, I believe that we must come to enforced publicity and governmental control, even as to prices. He virtually offered to turn price control over to the government. Colco states that the reason Gary and Carnegie were offering the powers of price control to the federal government was not known to the congressmen, who were quite unaware of the existing price anarchy in steel. The proposals of Gary and Carnegie, the Democratic majority on the committee reported, were really semi-socialistic and hardly worth endorsing. Footnote, Colco, Triumph, pages 173 to 174. 
Gary also proposed that a commission similar to the ICC be set up to grant, suspend, and revoke licenses for trade and to regulate prices. In the fall of 1911, the NCF moved in two fronts. It sent a questionnaire to 30,000 businessmen to seek out their positions on a number of issues. Businessmen favored regulation of trade by three to one. In November of 1911, Theodore Roosevelt proposed a national commission to control organization and capitalization of all interstate businesses. The proposal won an immediate and enthusiastic response from Wall Street. In 1912, Arthur Eddy, an eminent corporation lawyer, working much of the time with Standard Oil and one of the architects of the FTC, stated boldly in his magnum opus, The New Competition, what had been implicit in the doctrines of businessmen all along. Eddie trumpeted that competition was inhuman and war, and that war was hell. Thus did big businessmen believe and act. Meanwhile, back at the bank, J.P. Morgan was not to be left out. For Morgan, because of his ownership or control of many major corporations, was in the fight for regulation from the earliest days onward. Morgan's financial power and reputation were largely the result of his operations with the American and European governments. His many dealings in currency manipulations and loans to oppressive European states earned him the reputation of a rescuer of governments. One crucial aspect of the banking system at the beginning of the 1900s was the relative decrease in New York's financial dominance and the rise of competitors. Morgan was fully aware of the diffusion of banking power that was taking place, and it disturbed him. Hence, bankers, too, turned to regulation. From very early days, Morgan had championed the cause of a central bank, of gaining control over the nation's credit through a board of lending bankers under government supervision. By 1907, the NCF had taken up the call for a more elastic currency and for greater centralization of banking. Nelson Aldrich proposed a Reform Bank Act and called a conference of 22 bankers from 12 cities to discuss it. The purpose of the conference was to discuss winning the banking community over to government control directed by the bankers for their own ends. A leading banker, Paul Warburg, stated that it would be a blessing to get these small banks out of the way. Footnote, Colco, Triumph, page 183. Most of his associates agreed. In 1913, two years after the conference, and after any squabbles over specifics, the Federal Reserve Act was passed. The big bankers were pleased. These were not the only areas in which businessmen and their political henchmen were active. Indeed, ideologically speaking, they were behind innumerable progressive actions, and even financed such magazines as The New Republic. Teddy Roosevelt made a passing reference to the desirability of an income tax in his 1906 message to Congress, and the principal received support from such businessmen as George W. Perkins and Carnegie, who often referred to the unequal distribution of wealth as one of the crying evils of our day. Many businessmen opposed it, but the Wall Street Journal said it was certainly in favor of it. The passage of the Clayton Antitrust Act and the creation of the Federal Trade Commission occurred in 1914. Once established, the FTC began its attempt to secure the confidence of well-intentioned businessmen. In a speech before the NCF, one of the pro-regulation powerhouses, J.W. Jenks, affirmed the general feeling of relief among the leaders of large corporations and their understanding that the FTC was helpful to the corporations in every way. Footnote, Weinstein, page 91. In this crucially important era, I have focused on one point. Big business was a major source of American statism. Further researches would show, I am convinced, that big business and financial leaders were also the dominant force behind America's increasingly interventionist foreign policy and behind the ideology of modern liberalism. In fact, by this analysis, sustained research might show American liberal intellectuals to be the running dogs of big businessmen, to twist a Marxist phrase a little bit. Consider the fact that the New Republic has virtually always taken the role of defender of the corporate state, which big businessmen carefully constructed over decades. Consider the fact that such businessmen as Carnegie not only supported all the groups mentioned and the programs referred to, but also supported such things as the big Navy movement at the turn of the century. He sold steel to the United States government that went into the building of ships, and he saw in the Venezuela boundary dispute the possibility of a large order for armor from the United States Navy. Footnote, 
Walter Lefebvre, The New Empire, An Interpretation of American Expansion, 1860-1890. Ithaca, Cornell University Press, 1963, page 239, page 273, note. The note on Carnegie's linking of the Venezuela boundary dispute with obtaining large orders of steel from the Navy was taken from Carnegie's correspondence. Carnegie, along with Rockefeller and later Ford, was responsible for sustained support of American liberalism through the foundations set up in his name. J.P. Morgan, the key financial leader, was also a prime mover of American statism. His foreign financial dealings led him to become deeply involved with Britain during World War I, and this involvement in turn led him to persuade Wilson to enter the war on Britain's behalf to help save billions of dollars of loans which would be lost in the event of a German victory. In a more interesting light, consider the statements made in 1914 by S. Thruston Ballard, owner of the largest wheat refinery in the world. Ballard not only supported vocational schools as part of the public schools, which would transfer training costs to the taxpayers, restrictions on immigration, and a national minimum wage, he saw and proposed a way to cure unemployment. He advocated a federal employment service, public works, and if these were insufficient, government concentration camps where work with a small wage would be provided, supplemented by agricultural and industrial training. Footnote, Weinstein, page 91. Consider the role of big businessmen in pushing through public education in many states after World War I. Senator Wadsworth spoke before a NCF group in 1916, pointing out that compulsory government education was needed to protect the nation against destruction from within. It is to train the boy and girl to be good citizens, to protect against ignorance and dissipation. This meant that the reason to force children to go to school, at gunpoint if necessary, was so that they could be brainwashed into accepting the status quo, almost explicitly so that their capacity for dissent, i.e. their capacity for independent thinking, could be destroyed. Thus did Wadsworth also advocate compulsory and universal military training. Our people shall be prepared mentally as well as in a purely military sense. We must let our young men know that they owe some responsibility to this country. Indeed, we find V. E. Macy, president of the NCF at the close of the war, stating that it was not beside the mark to call attention to the nearly 30 million minors marching steadily toward full citizenship, and ask at what stage of their journey we should lend assistance to the work of quickening the sense of responsibility and partnership in the business of maintaining and perfecting the splendid social, industrial, and commercial structure which has been reared under the American flag. The need, Macy noted, was most urgent. Among American youths, there was a widespread indifference toward and aloofness from individual responsibility for the successful maintenance and upbuilding of the industrial and commercial structure which is the indispensable shelter of us all. Footnote, Weinstein, pages 133 to 135. Big business, then, was behind the existence and curriculum of the public educational system, explicitly to teach young minds to submit and obey, to pay homage to the corporate liberal system which the politicians, a multitude of intellectuals, and many big businessmen created. My intention here simply has been to present an alternative model of historical interpretation of key events in this one crucial era of American history, an interpretation which is neither Marxist, liberal, nor conservative, but which may have some elements in common with each. From a more ideological perspective, my purpose has been to present an accurate portrait of one aspect of how we got here and indicate a new way of looking at the present system in America. To a large degree, it has been and remains big businessmen who are the fountainheads of American statism. If libertarians are seeking allies in their struggle for liberty, then I suggest that they look elsewhere. Conservatives, too, should benefit from this essay and begin to see big business as a destroyer, not as a unit of the free market. Liberals should also benefit and re-examine their own premises about the market and regulation. Specifically, they might reconsider the nature of a free market and ponder on the question of why big business has been opposed to precisely that. Isn't it odd that the interests of liberals and key big businessmen have always coincided? The Marxists, too, might rethink their economics and reconsider whether or not capitalism leads to monopoly. 
since it can be shown scientifically that economic calculation is impossible in a purely socialistic economy and that pure statism is not good for man, perhaps the Marxists might also look at the real nature of a complete free market undiluted by state control. Libertarians themselves should take heart. Our hope lies, as strange as it may seem, not with any remnants from an illusory golden age of individualism, which never existed, but with tomorrow. Our day has not come and gone. It has never existed at all. It is our task to see that it will exist in the future. The choice and the battle are ours. Regulation. The cause, not the cure, of the financial crisis. Roderick T. Long, 2008. People who blame the crisis on the free market have things precisely backward. Market prices are the mechanism that allows consumer rankings of consumption goods to determine choices among production goods. If consumers rank goods made from steel higher than goods made from rubber, steel prices will rise relative to those of rubber, thus encouraging economizing of existing steel and increased production of new steel. This is incidentally why anti-gouging laws are such a bad idea. They prolong the very shortages whose effects they're trying to mitigate by suppressing the price signals that function to end the shortage. When prices are legally prevented from rising during a shortage, it's like sending out a signal into the market saying, Hey everybody, no shortage here. No reason to economize on this item. No reason to increase production of this item. Feel free to focus your investment elsewhere, which is obviously the worst possible message to send. Interest rates are a kind of price also. They signal the extent to which consumers are willing and able to defer present satisfactions for the sake of greater future satisfactions. To take the standard example, if Crusoe makes a net, he'll be able to catch far more fish than he can with his hands, but time making the net takes away from time catching fish. If Crusoe can afford to defer some present fish catching in order to make the net, then it's rational for him to make it. But if instead he's on the edge of starvation and might not be able to survive on reduced rations long enough to finish the net, he'd better stick to catching fish with his hands for the moment and save the net project for another day. Whether it makes sense for him to divert time and effort from fish catching to net making thus depends on how urgently he needs fish now, in short, on his time preference. In a free market, low interest rates signal low time preference and high interest rates high time preference. If your time preference, i.e. the urgency of your preference for present over future satisfactions, is low, then I would only have to offer you slightly more than X a year from now in order to induce you to part with X today. If it is high, then I would have to offer you a lot more than X a year from now in exchange for X today. The prevailing interest rate thus guides investors in their choice between short-term, less productive projects and those that are more productive but whose benefits will take longer to achieve. But when central banks, through their manipulation of the money supply, artificially lower the interest rate, then the signals get distorted. Investors are led to act as though consumers have a lower time preference than they actually do. Thus, investors are led to invest in longer-term projects that are unsustainable, since the deferred consumption on which such projects depend is not actually going to get deferred, so that the goods that the investors are counting on in order to complete their long-term projects are not all going to be there when the investors need them. Such unsustainable investment is the boom or bubble. The bust comes when the unsustainability is recognized and a costly process of liquidation ensues. The Austrian theory of the business cycle is sometimes called an overinvestment theory, but that's misleading. The problem is not that investors overinvest across the board, but that they overinvest in higher yield, longer term projects and underinvest in lower yield, shorter term. That's why Austrians talk about malinvestment rather than overinvestment. The prevailing mainstream tendency to treat capital as homogeneous ignores the difference between higher and lower levels of production goods and thus fails to appreciate the costs of having to switch from the high to the low when the bubble bursts. In addition to the general misallocation of investment between lower order and higher order inputs, monetary inflation produces further imbalances. When the central bank creates money, the new money doesn't propagate through the economy instantaneously. Some sectors get the new money first while they're still facing the old, lower prices, while other sectors get the new money last after they've already begun facing the higher prices. 
The result of such cantillion effects is not only a systematic redistribution of wealth from those less to those more favored by the banking government complex, but an artificial stimulation of certain sectors of the economy, making them look more inherently profitable than they are, and so directing economically unjustified levels of investment toward them. Does the Austrian account, as is often claimed, underestimate the ability of investors and entrepreneurs to recognize the effects of government policies and compensate for them? No. Even if you know that a given price represents some mix of genuine market signals and government distortion, you may not know how much of the price represents which factor, so how can you compensate for the distorting factor? Likewise, if you know there are magnetic anomalies in the area that are throwing off your compass, that's not terribly helpful information unless you know exactly where the anomalies are and how strong they are compared with the Earth's magnetic field. Otherwise, you have no way to correct for them. And given that the direction of your compass's needle is at least partly responsive to true north, you're better off trusting it, despite its distortions, than simply abandoning your compass and proceeding by coin flip. On the Austrian understanding, governmental inflation of the money supply, thereby artificially lowering interest rates, was the chief cause of the Great Depression. Mainstream economists dispute this, holding that the Fed's policy could not have been genuinely inflationary, since prices were relatively stable during the period leading up to the crash. But for Austrians, the crucial question is not whether prices were higher than they had previously been, but whether they were higher than they would have been in the absence of monetary inflation. Likewise, for Austrians, the housing bubble that precipitated the current crisis was the product of the Federal Reserve's low-interest policies of recent years. An aside to address a frequent misunderstanding. On the Austrian view, there is nothing wrong with low-interest rates per se. Indeed, low-interest rates are a symptom of a healthy economy. Since the more prosperous people are, the likelier they are to be willing to defer present consumption. But one cannot make an economy healthy by artificially inducing symptoms of health in the absence of their underlying cause. By the same principle, absence of scabbing on one's skin is a sign of physical health, but if there is scabbing, one does not promote health by ripping the scabs away. Advocates of minimum wage laws take note. In the 1920s, while mainstream economists were claiming that stock prices had reached a permanently high plateau, Mises and Hayek were predicting a crash, as incidentally was my grandfather, Charles Roderick McKay, who as deputy governor of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago protested against the Fed's policy of artificially lowered interest rates, kept the Chicago branch out of the easy money policy until centrally overridden, foresaw the likely results and got the hell out of the stock market well before the crash. Likewise, in recent years, Austrians kept warning of a housing bubble, while folks like Greenspan and Bernanke blithely insisted that the housing market was sound. Now everyone these days is saying, quite sensibly, that in the present crisis we need to avoid the mistakes that lengthened the Great Depression. The problem is that this advice is useless without an accurate understanding of what those mistakes were. By Austrian standards, the current plan to inject more liquidity into the economy is simply treating the disease with more of the poison that originally caused it. Attempting to cure an illness by artificially simulating symptoms of health is literally voodoo economics. Of course, the Federal Reserve is not solely to blame. There are still further government policies that encouraged riskier loans. There's been some media attention paid to Clinton-era changes in the Community Reinvestment Act, for example, that encouraged laxer lending standards in order to attract minority borrowers. The claim that this explanation is racist is confusing the reason why a given loan is risky with the reason why the loan, despite its riskiness, gets made. All the same, focusing on this narrow example misses the wider picture, which is that when the federal government sponsors massive credit corporations like Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, it creates an expectation, whether codified in law or not, that the government is guaranteeing their solvency. Just as with the SNL crisis of the 80s, the expectation of reimbursement in the case of failure encourages riskier loans because the risk is socialized. And beyond this are the still deeper factors that stifle affluence for the vast majority and so make it necessary for them to borrow money to buy a home in the first place. Taking that necessity for granted requires justification. 
Even George Bush, in his speech on the crisis, recognized, or read words written by people who recognized, that the expectation that a bailout would be forthcoming if needed had helped to encourage riskier loans, though he seemed to miss the further implication that by going on to urge a bailout, he was confirming and reinforcing the very expectations that had helped fuel the crisis, thus setting the economy up for a repeat of the crisis in the future. The grain of truth in the otherwise ludicrous statist mantra that the financial crisis was caused by a lack of regulation is that when you pass Regulation A granting a private or semi-private firm the right to play with other people's money, but then repeal or fail to enact Regulation B restricting the firm's ability to take excessive risks with that money, the ensuing crisis is in a sense to be attributed in part to the absence of Regulation B. But the fatal factor is not the absence of Regulation B per se, but the absence of B when combined with the presence of A. The absence of B would cause no problem if A were absent as well. So sure there was insufficient regulation. If by insufficient regulation, you mean a failure on government's part to rein in, via further regulations, the problems created by its initial regulations. So, if the problem is caused by A without B, it might be objected, why must we adopt the libertarian solution of getting rid of A? Can't we solve the problem just as well by keeping A but adding Regulation B alongside it? The answer is no, because central planning doesn't work. When one responds to bad regulations by adding new regs to counteract the old ones, rather than simply repealing the old ones, one adds more and more layers between decisions and the market, increasingly muffling price system feedback and courting calculational chaos. But, the objector may continue, what if we're in a situation where we have Regulation A but no Regulation B, and where further, repealing A is not politically possible, but adding Regulation B is? In that case, shouldn't we push to add B? In some circumstances, depending on the details, maybe so. But the more important question to my mind is, to which should we devote more of our time and energy? Tweaking the details of a fundamentally unsound system within the parameters of what is currently considered politically possible? Or working to shift those parameters themselves? In Hayek's words, those who have concerned themselves exclusively with what seemed practicable in the existing state of opinion have constantly found that this has rapidly become politically impossible as the result of changes in a public opinion which they have done nothing to guide. Okay, some will say, maybe it was government, not laissez-faire, that got us into the mess, but now that we're in it, don't we need government to get us out? My answer is that government doesn't have the ability to get us out. There's just not much the government can do that will help, apart from repealing the laws, regulations, and subsidies that first created and then perpetuate the mess, but that would be less a doing than a ceasing to do, and anyway, given the incentives acting on government decision-makers, there's no realistic chance of that happening. The bailout is just diverting resources from the productive poor and middle class to the failed rich, which doesn't seem like a very good idea on either ethical or economic grounds. The only good effect such a bailout could possibly have, at least if you prefer costly boondoggles without piles of dead bodies to costly boondoggles with them, is if it convinced the warmongers that they just can't afford a global war on terror right now. But there's no sign that they're being convinced of anything of the sort. If the price system were allowed to function fully, the crisis would right itself, not instantly or painlessly, to be sure, but far more quickly and with less dislocation than any government could manage. What the government should do is, in the final analysis, nothing. But such a response would be politically impossible. Quite true, but what makes it politically impossible? Is it some corporatist bias on the part of the American people? Did Congress pass the bailout because the voters were clamoring for it? On the contrary, most of the voters seem to have been decidedly against it. The bailout passed because Congress is primarily accountable not to the electorate but to big business. And that's a source of political impossibility that stems not from shiftable ideology but from the inherent nature of representative government. A government that was genuinely responsible to the people would hardly be a parasite, since the people are hardly free from ignorance and bias, and majority rule is all too often simply a mechanism for externalizing the costs of majority preference onto minorities. But debating the merits of a government genuinely responsible to the people is purely academic, because such a government, whatever its merits or demerits, is impossible. You cannot make a monopoly responsive to the people. 
Other than the market itself, no political system has ever been devised or discovered that will subordinate the influence of concentrated interests to that of dispersed interests. Monopoly cannot be reformed. It has to be abolished. Now, that is, of course, not to say that some governments can't be less unresponsive than others, just as some forms of slavery can be less awful than others. One of the striking features of slavery in the antebellum American South, for example, is how much worse it was on average than most other historical forms of slavery. And if the abolitionists, despairing of the prospects of actually freeing the slaves, had focused their efforts on reforming American slavery to make it more like ancient Greco-Roman slavery or medieval Scandinavian slavery, I'm not going to say that it wouldn't have been worth doing or it wouldn't have made a lot of people's lives significantly better, but isn't it setting one's political sights a tad low? Industrial Economics Dyer D. Lum, 1890 I desire to group certain deductions, both critical and constructive, that we may better see the paramount importance of freedom in industrial economics. 1. Division of labor is an outgrowth of social progress, essential to the augmentation of wealth, the evils incidental to it being the result of extraneous causes. And economists, in speaking of limitations and disadvantages of this social law, have shown their incompetence to clearly analyze the essential factors of the industrial problem. It is not in division, but in the subordination of division to privilege, that the economists make the error of ascribing disadvantages to a law evolved in social growth. The element of freedom lacking in exchange, division consequently falls under the control of prerogative, hence the limitations and disadvantages of which economists learnedly prate. 2. Machinery socializes where division isolates. Machinery is to the industrial toiler what the musket is to the militant supporter, a tool by which their respective lines of activity are rendered effective. In the cheapening of products, in the annihilation of time by the telegraph and of space by the railway, and the countless facilities to comfort with which we are surrounded, we see the social results of machinery. Economists never weary of dwelling on the benefits of labor saved by the use of machinery, but gloss over the actual fact that a rapid increase of mechanical appliances tends to render the artisan a superfluous quantity and a marketless tool. Under natural relations, whatever tends to lessen the exhaustiveness of toil and cheapen products should also redound to the direct, no less than the indirect, benefit of the individual laborer. Here again, we find freedom lacking in distribution and are forced to look elsewhere for the cause of the restrictions to ascertain whether they arise from natural causes or artificial interference. 3. Monopoly has been fostered under the delusive pretext of protecting industry by hedging in a portion of human activity at the expense of the rest, and at the same time as zealously protecting the very restrictions of which labor complains. The opposite school, having a partial view of the truth that the law of supply and demand can only have full course under liberty, and that all interference but hampers their natural adaptation to each other, still believed that they were contending under that standard while limiting their demands for freedom of trade to the manufactured product, an error which even Herbert Spencer has not escaped. In asserting theoretical liberty for labor and capital, they are blind to the fact that labor was handicapped inasmuch as the capital employed was the offspring of monopoly. Thus their freedom only enters in after monopolized production has thrown the product on the market and is never conceived as entering into relations prior to production. Consequently, in the present strained relations between capital and labor, we find the freedom of contract a meaningless phrase, and professed apostles of liberty, like Amasa Walker, delivering themselves as follows. In relation to capital and labor, there must be a just proportion of each to the most efficient production, sufficient labor for the capital, and capital for the laborer. So there must be sufficient enterprise, business talent, and tact to use both, and the several parties must be left to act voluntarily, under the instincts of human nature and the laws of value. Footnote. Amasa Walker, The Science of Wealth, a Manual of Political Economy Embracing the Laws of Trade, Currency, and Finance. Boston, Little, 1866, page 281. 
The text of the quotation has been slightly corrected from Lum's original text to ensure that it matches Walker's. Whether legalization of the lower instincts and the speculative laws now dominant tend to the higher evolution of free action, our apostle of liberty saith not. 4. Competition is the exact opposite, not parent, of monopoly. Freedom is essential to true competition, and wherever restriction exists on one side, it implies privilege on the other. And in so far competition ceases, monopoly rather than competition now exists. In the abrogation of privilege, competition becomes not only free, but acts, as the governor on an engine, self-regulative, and bringing cost as the means of price. Our friends the enemy, the socialists, in flying into a passion at the mention of competition, but thereby betray their own logical adherence to the militant camp, for liberty includes and implies freedom to compete. But that cannot in justice be called a competitive system where wages are constantly depressed as with an iron hand as a definite residual dividend, and the divorce between labor and capital justified as calling in an indispensable go-between whose earnings or profits constitute a special or fourth branch of the national income, coordinate with rent, wages, and interest on capital, and hailed as an extension of freedom. Footnote Wilhelm Rorscher, Principles of Political Economy, translation by John J. Lalore, two volumes, New York, Holt, 1878, Chapter 2, page 146. 5. The real problem is a far deeper one than enters into the arguments of the advocates of protection and restriction or of a post-production liberty. It is the same as has for centuries past underlain all struggles in social progress, and which, looking back over the centuries, we find recorded as ever one for the sovereignty of the individual, the widening of the sphere of personal initiative, the conflict between militant authority and personal liberty. The renaissance of mind from scholastic tyranny, the revolt of Luther and his followers against mental dictation, the temporary compromise in religious toleration, the insurrection against kingcraft, leading in its triumph to the toleration of political opinions, have now logically led to an insurrection against economic subjugation to the privileges usurped and hotly defended by capital in its alliance with labor, and calling from thinkers of all schools, even from economic Hessian allies, the prediction that unless an equitable adjustment be found, civilization must again go through the parturition pangs of revolutionary strife and bloodshed. By one or other of these antagonistic principles must every proposed solution be tested, and reposing confidently on the historical development of progress, wherein even the man of genius is but the secretary of his age, we assert that no answer can be given to the eternal conflict that is not based upon full freedom to human activity, for freedom destroys strife by removing its cause, denial of freedom. With these deductions for our guide, we begin the search for economic laws based upon justice, enlightened by wisdom, supported by truth, in which alone industry can find its goal in equitable cooperation. Taking these, therefore, as the basis of industrial economics, rather than laws describing modes of action under inequitable conditions, we have been led to demand for labor. 6. Free land, that labor in its struggle shall not forever find the source of production the ward of monopoly, and thus left upon as unequal a footing to compete in production as existed between the slave and his master. That as land is the source of production, its real or natural value lies in its use, not what it will bring where privilege exists to give it a fictitious value. One of the effects of this would be the elimination of rent as a necessary prelude to occupancy, or a factor in the distribution of the shares of production. That under freedom of access to vacant land, and the spring it would give to production, labor would determine a juster proportionality of values between products, wherein alone real value exists. We see in nationalization of land but a recurrence to militancy in its methods, and its application beset with many fatal compromises. To one who accepts authority, rather than liberty, as a guiding principle, the conclusion may be natural. 
but to one who endeavors to square his principles by the test of liberty, whether land can be called private property or not, after it has ceased to be a factor in economic exploitation, is immaterial. Liberty cannot deny the calling of one's possession of anything his own. It is in the power given by legalization to hold for speculative purposes, not particular possession for occupancy, that the danger to civilization lies. We also submit that making it common property involves invasion of individual freedom to use, for it can be neither so made nor so maintained except by militant methods, whether under George's or Most's attempted organization of liberty. 7. Free exchange would break the monopoly now possessed by currency, the instrument of exchange, and also could open full use of the possession of land. Today the small retail dealer cannot compete with the merchant prince in the purchase of goods, any more than the mechanic who buys his coal by the bushel enters into competition with one who buys his year's supply by the cargo. Has the workman equal freedom to compete with the employer of labor? Can hands enter the market on equal term with the wealthy contractor? But why not? Because behind the capitalist, as we now find him, privilege lends support which transforms the result of honest industry into a hideous Moloch standing with outstretched arms to receive as a sacrificial victim the toilers who have made that capital possible. The legalized power given to money determines the difference. It makes it more than the mere instrument of exchange. It becomes an implement of exploitation, having a fictitious value, and culling from industry to increase by payment for use. Thus claiming that yesterday's labor is more than wealth acquired, and through interest entitled to prerogatives not granted to today's labor but even taken from it. We thus see that it is not capital per se that liberty assails, but the artificial power it usurps, that under equal freedom, where no privilege exists to entail exploitation, it is as harmless as we have seen private property would be. Capital itself is man's best friend, the true social savior that opens the march of progress and that has transformed society from warlike to peaceful pursuits. But under the crucifying hands of legalization, where prerogative mocks at penury, its mission is thwarted and it becomes a ravenous beast. As Satan is said to have once been an angel of light, so in the denial of equal freedom to the capitalization of the fruits of labor, capital has become a demon of hell and beyond the power of redemption by single tax sanctification. 8. Mutual banking, we have seen, would open the door for relief. In the absence of artificial restraint upon individual activity, that everyone in possession of returns for labor applied, endorsed by business capacity or not, whether individually or by association, could command credit to the extent of their honestly acquired wealth, or confidence in their pledge of labor force, and use their own labor as a basis for increased production. Whether production would then be individualistic or associative, on which the author has strong convictions, would not in the least alter the case. Freedom to normal growth secured, its natural course is a detail which would regulate itself. The fact remains that under release from compulsory rent and cessation of usury, energy and capacity would be more assiduously cultivated and command greater confidence than a state certificate for honesty, and thereby create an ample medium for exchange based on labor products. To doubt it is to assert that capacity and energy, together with inventive talent, can only germinate where exhaustive mental or manual labor most exist, and where rest and recreation are least known. Credit would be a matter of confidence in both security and character, and character would be as essential an element then as shrewdness and cunning are now. Business, emancipated from inequitable conditions, would continue as uninterruptedly as under the present system of a mortgage security on the source of production where labor toils for another's benefit, and the benumbing effect of a Frankenstein state no longer repress individuality nor inspire the superstitious with awe. Insurance or security. Under equal freedom, wherever demand exists, supply necessarily will be forthcoming, and guarantees for security will arise as easy as guarantees for politeness in the ballroom or parlor. 
Under equal opportunities, wherever mankind are thrown upon their own resources, when being fed from a spoon by government pap shall have become a traditionary tale of a past superstition, what is there in the power of activity that cooperative enterprise cannot undertake? We now see on every hand a thousand instances of voluntary association to attain certain objects. Many such deemed impractical a few centuries since are commonplaces today. Who will say the limit has been reached? Even in functions government assumes as necessary, we find voluntary militia and home guards, fire departments in many places in which all members risk their lives and turn out in all weather to render the lives and property of their neighbors secure. Associations of private watchmen who find support, even though their patrons pay taxes for municipal police protection. A fire patrol in the interests of insurance companies to protect property from destruction. These are instances of cooperation applied to guaranteeing security, of supply seeking demand without difficulty or friction, a demand by no means dependent upon legalization, but supplementing its deficiencies. All relations under equal freedom will tend to become associative when and where it is seen to be most effective. Freedom for the individual cannot be construed into compulsory isolation. What is even now done by wealthy mill owners may be done by all when equal opportunities to exploit nature shall have removed special privileges to exploit fellow men, when cooperation in all needed relations lies open before us and labor enjoys its full just share of the wealth or values it creates. With its resultant release from rent, interest, profits, and taxation as enforced tribute, the causes for vice and crime would rapidly diminish, for free access to nature would open to all more than a competence, and in ease give greater scope to the purely human sympathies for the unfortunate. And so far as protection from the still vicious and idle is concerned, an extension of the scope of insurance can meet all requirements. An organization for protection to person and labor product, or property if you will, composed of those who felt the need for the exercise of such functions, in which loss by depredation would involve no greater difficulty than loss by fire, would naturally arise where such demand existed. The difference between the watchmen of such an organization, whose functions consist in mutual protection and defense of the equal limits of personal freedom for commercial needs, and a political policy system wherein personal liberty is subordinated to inanimate things as of a greater importance than their creators, is so apparent to the candid reader that I need not pause to dwell upon it. Progress and order is the true expression of social evolution, rather than the reverse, for law is ever fixity, and its resulting order but uniformity wherein progress finds its grave. Order based upon progress, on the contrary, ever retains the plasticity essential to the latter, and this can only be realized in the further evolution of the law of equal freedom required by the industrial type. Such is anarchy. Labor Struggle in a Free Market Kevin A. Carson, 2008 One of the most common questions raised about a hypothetical free market society concerns worker protection laws of various kinds. As Roderick Long puts it, In a free nation, will employees be at the mercy of employers? Under current law, employers are often forbidden to pay wages lower than a certain amount, to demand that employees work in hazardous conditions or sleep with the boss, or to fire without cause or notice. What would be the fate of employees without these protections? Long argues that, despite the absence of many of today's formal legal protections, the shift of bargaining power toward workers in a free labor market will result in a reduction in the petty tyrannies of the job world. Employers will be legally free to demand anything they want of their employees. They will be permitted to sexually harass them, make them perform hazardous work under risky conditions, to fire them without notice, and so forth. But bargaining power will have shifted to favor the employee. Since prosperous economies generally see an increase in the number of new ventures but a decrease in the birth rate, jobs will be chasing workers rather than vice versa. 
Employees will not feel coerced into accepting mistreatment because it will be so much easier to find a new job, and workers will have more clout when initially hired to demand a contract which rules out certain treatment, mandates reasonable notice for layoffs, stipulates parental leave, or whatever. And the kind of horizontal coordination made possible by telecommunications networking opens up the prospect that unions could become effective at collective bargaining without having to surrender authority to a union boss. This last is especially important. Present-day labor law limits the bargaining power of labor as much as it reinforces it. That's especially true of reactionary legislation like Taft-Hartley and state right-to-work laws. Both are clearly abhorrent to free market principles. Taft-Hartley, for example, prohibited many of the successful labor strategies during the CIO organizing strikes of the early 30s. The CIO planned strikes like a general staff plans a campaign, with strikes in a plant supported by sympathy and boycott strikes up and down the production chain, from suppliers to outlets, and supported by transport workers refusing to haul scab cargo. At their best, the CIO's strikes turned into regional general strikes. Right-wing libertarians of the vulgar sort like to argue that unions depend primarily on the threat of force, backed by the state, to exclude non-union workers. Without forcible exclusion of scabs, they say, strikes would almost always turn into lockouts and union defeats. Although this has acquired the status of dogma at Mises.org, it's nonsense on stilts. The primary reason for the effectiveness of a strike is not the exclusion of scabs, but the transaction costs involved in hiring and training replacement workers, and the steep loss of productivity entailed in the disruption of human capital, institutional memory, and tacit knowledge. With the strike organized in depth, with multiple lines of defense, those sympathy and boycott strikes at every stage of production, the cost and disruption have a multiplier effect far beyond that of a strike in a single plant. Under such conditions, even a large minority of workers walking off the job at each stage of production can be quite effective. Taft-Hartley greatly reduced the effectiveness of strikes at individual plants by prohibiting such coordination of actions across multiple plants or industries. Taft-Hartley's cooling-off periods also gave employers advance warning time to prepare for such disruptions and greatly reduced the informational rents embodied in the training of the existing workforce. Were such restrictions on sympathy and boycott strikes and suppliers not in place, today's just-in-time economy would likely be far more vulnerable to disruption than that of the 1930s. But long before Taft-Hartley, the labor law regime of the New Deal had already created a fundamental shift in the form of labor struggle. Before Wagner and the NLRB-enforced collective bargaining process, labor struggle was less focused on strikes and more focused on what workers did in the workplace itself to exert leverage against management. They focused, in other words, on what the Wobblies called direct action on the job, or in the colorful phrase of a British radical workers' daily at the turn of the century, staying in on strike. The reasoning was explained in the Wobbly pamphlet, How to Fire Your Boss, A Worker's Guide to Direct Action. The bosses, with their large financial reserves, are better able to withstand a long, drawn-out strike than the workers. In many cases, court injunctions will freeze or confiscate the union's strike funds. And worst of all, a long walkout only gives the boss a chance to replace striking workers with a scab, replacement, workforce. Workers are far more effective when they take direct action while still on the job. By deliberately reducing the boss's profits while continuing to collect wages, you can cripple the boss without giving some scab the opportunity to take your job. Such tactics included slowdowns, sick ins, random one day walkouts at unannounced intervals, working to rule, good work strikes, and open mouth sabotage. Labor followed, in other words, a classic asymmetric warfare model. Instead of playing by the enemy's rules and suffering one honorable defeat after another, they played by their own rules and mercilessly exploited the enemy's weak points. The whole purpose of the Wagner regime was to put an end to this asymmetric warfare model. As Thomas Ferguson and G. William Domhoff have both argued, corporate backing for the New Deal labor accord came mostly from capital-intensive industry, the heart of the New Deal coalition in general. Because of the complicated technical nature of their production process and their long planning horizons, their management required long-term stability and predictability. At the same time, because they were extremely capital-intensive, labor costs were a relatively modest part of total costs. Management, therefore, was willing to trade significant wage increases and job security for social peace on the job.
Wagner came about not because the workers were begging for it, but because the bosses were begging for a regime of enforceable labor contracts. The purpose of the Wagner regime was to divert labor away from the asymmetric warfare model to a new one, in which union bureaucrats enforced the terms of contracts on their own membership. The primary function of union bureaucracies under the new order was to suppress wildcat action by their rank and file, to suppress direct action on the job, and to limit labor action to declared strikes under NLRB rules. The New Deal labor agenda had the same practical effect as telling the militiamen at Lexington and Concord to come out from behind the rocks, put on bright red uniforms, and march in parade ground formation— in return for a system of arbitration to guarantee they didn't lose all the time. The problem is that bosses decided long ago that labor was still winning too much of the time, even under the Wagner regime. Their first response was Taft-Hartley and the right-to-work laws. From that point on, union membership stopped growing and then began a slow and inexorable process of decline that continues to the present day. The process picked up momentum around 1970, when management decided that the New Deal labor accord had outlived its usefulness altogether and embraced the full union-busting potential under Taft-Hartley in earnest. But the official labor movement still forgoes the weapons it laid down in the 1930s. It sticks to wearing its bright red uniforms and marching in parade ground formation, and gets massacred every time. Labor needs to reconsider its strategy, and in particular take a new look at the asymmetric warfare techniques it has abandoned for so long. The effectiveness of these techniques is a logical result of the incomplete nature of the labor contract. According to Michael Reich and James Devine, conflict is inherent in the employment relation because the employer does not purchase a specified quantity of performed labor, but rather control over the worker's capacity to work over a given time period, and because the worker's goals differ from those of the employer. The amount of labor actually done is determined by a struggle between workers and capitalists. The labor contract is incomplete because it is impossible for a contract to specify ahead of time the exact levels of effort and standards of performance expected of workers. The specific terms of the contract can only be worked out in the contested terrain of the workplace. The problem is compounded by the fact that management's authority in the workplace isn't exogenous. That is, it isn't enforced by the external legal system at zero cost to the employer. Rather, it's endogenous. Management's authority is enforced entirely with the resources and at the expense of the company. And workers' compliance with directives is frequently costly and sometimes impossible to enforce. Employers are forced to resort to endogenous enforcement. When there is no relevant third party, when the contested attribute can be measured only imperfectly or at considerable cost, work effort, for example, or the degree of risk assumed by a firm's management, when the relevant evidence is not admissible in a court of law, when there is no possible means of redress, or when the nature of the contingencies concerning future states of the world relevant to the exchange precludes writing a fully specified contract. In such cases, the ex post terms of exchange are determined by the structure of the interaction between A and B, and in particular on the strategies A is able to adopt to induce B to provide the desired level of the contested attribute and the counter strategies available to B. An employment relationship is established when, in return for a wage, the worker B agrees to submit to the authority of the employer A for a specified period of time in return for a wage W. While the employer's promise to pay the wage is legally enforceable, the worker's promise to bestow an adequate level of effort and care upon the tasks assigned, even if offered, is not. Work is subjectively costly for the worker to provide, valuable to the employer, and costly to measure. The manager-worker relationship is thus a contested exchange. Footnote. Samuel Bowles and Herbert Gintis. Is the demand for workplace democracy redundant in a liberal economy? Democracy and Efficiency in the Economic Enterprise. Edited by Ugo Pagano and Robert Rowthorne. London, Routledge, 1996, pages 64 to 81. Since it is impossible to define the terms of the contract exhaustively up front, bargaining, as Oliver Williamson puts it, is pervasive. 
The classic illustration of the contested nature of the workplace under incomplete labor contracting and the pervasiveness of bargaining is the struggle over the pace and intensity of work, reflected in both the slowdown and working to rule. At its most basic, the struggle over the pace of work is displayed in what Oliver Williamson calls perfunctory cooperation as opposed to consummate cooperation. Consummate cooperation is an affirmative job attitude to include the use of judgment, filling gaps, and taking initiative in an instrumental way. Perfunctory cooperation, by contrast, involves job performance of a minimally acceptable sort. The upshot is that workers, by shifting to a perfunctory performance mode, are in a position to destroy idiosyncratic efficiency gains. He quotes Peter Blau and Richard Scott's observation to the same effect. The contract obligates employees to perform only a set of duties in accordance with minimum standards and does not assure their striving to achieve optimum performance. Legal authority does not and cannot command the employee's willingness to devote his ingenuity and energy to performing his tasks to the best of his ability. It promotes compliance with directives and discipline, but does not encourage employees to exert effort, to accept responsibilities, or to exercise initiative. Legal authority, likewise, does not and cannot prescribe working to rule, which is nothing but obeying management's directives literally and without question. If they're the brains behind the operation, and we get paid to shut up and do what we're told, then by God, that's just what we'll do. Disgruntled workers, Williamson suggests, will respond to intrusive or authoritarian attempts at surveillance and monitoring with a passive-aggressive strategy of compliance in areas where effective metering is possible, while shifting their perfunctory compliance, or worse, into areas where it is impossible. True to the asymmetric warfare model, the costs of management measures for verifying compliance are generally far greater than the costs of circumventing those measures. As frequent commenter Jeremy Wayland says, you are the monkey wrench. Their need for us to behave in an orderly, predictable manner is a vulnerability of theirs. It can be exploited. You have the ability to transform from a replaceable part into a monkey wrench. At this point, some libertarians are probably stopping up their ears and going, la la la, can't hear you, la la la. Under the values most of us have been encultured into, values which are reinforced by the decidedly pro-employer and anti-worker libertarian mainstream, such deliberate sabotage of productivity and withholding of effort are tantamount to laissez majesté. But there's no rational basis for this emotional reaction. The fact that we take such a viscerally asymmetrical view of the respective rights and obligations of employers and employees is itself evidence that cultural hangovers from master-servant relationships have contaminated our understanding of the employment relation in a free market. The employer and employee, under free market principles, are equal parties to the employment contract. As things normally work now, and as mainstream libertarianism unfortunately takes for granted, the employer is expected, as a normal matter of course, to take advantage of the incomplete nature of the employment contract. One can hardly go to Cato or Mises.org on any given day without stumbling across an article lionizing the employer's right to extract maximum effort in return for minimum pay if he can get away with it. His rights to change the terms of the employment relation, to speed up the work process, to maximize work per dollar of wages, are his by the grace of God. Well, if the worker and employer really are equal parties to a voluntary contract, as free market theory says they are, then it works both ways. The worker's attempts to maximize his own utility under the contested terms of an incomplete contract are every bit as morally legitimate as those of the boss. The worker has every bit as much of a right to attempt to minimize his effort per dollar of wages as the boss has to attempt to maximize it. What constitutes a fair level of effort is entirely a subjective cultural norm and can only be determined by the real-world bargaining strength of bosses and workers in a particular workplace. And as Kevin DePew argues, the continued barrage of downsizing, speed-ups, and stress will likely result in a drastic shift in workers' subjective perceptions of a fair level of effort and of the legitimate ways to slow down. Productivity, like most financial virtues, is the product of positive social mood trends. As social mood transitions to negative, we can expect to see less and less virtue in hard work. Think about it. Real wages are virtually stagnant, so it's not as if people have experienced real reward for their work. 
What has been experienced is an unconscious and shared hurting impulse trending upward, a shared optimistic mood finding joy and happiness in work, and denigrating the sole pursuit of leisure, idleness. If social mood has, in fact, peaked, we can expect to see a different attitude toward work and productivity emerge. The problem is that, to date, bosses have fully capitalized on the potential of the incomplete contract, whereas workers have not. And the only thing preventing workers from doing so is the little boss inside their heads, the cultural holdover from master-servant days that tells them it's wrong to do so. I aim to kill that little guy, and I believe that when workers fully realize the potential of the incomplete labor contract and become as willing to exploit it as the bosses have been all these years, we'll mop the floor with their asses. And we can do it in a free market without any help from the NLRB. Let the bosses beg for help. One aspect of direct action that especially interests me is so-called open-mouth sabotage, which, like most forms of networked resistance, has seen its potential increased by several orders of magnitude by the Internet. Labor struggle, at least the kind conducted on asymmetric warfare principles, is just one subset of the general category of networked resistance. In the military realm, networked resistance is commonly discussed under the general heading of fourth-generation warfare. In the field of radical political activism, networked organization represents a quantum increase in the crisis of governability that Samuel Huntington complained of in the early 70s. The coupling of networked political organization with the Internet in the 90s was the subject of a rather panic-stricken genre of literature at the Rand Corporation, most of it written by David Ronfeldt and John Arkea. The first major RAND study on the subject concerned the Zapatista's Global Political Support Network and was written before the Seattle demos. Loosely networked coalitions of affinity groups, organizing through the Internet, could throw together large demonstrations with little notice and swarm government and mainstream media with phone calls, letters, and emails far beyond their capacity to absorb. Given this elite reaction to what turned out to be a mere foreshadowing, the Seattle demonstrations of December 1999 and the anti-globalization demonstrations that followed must have been especially dramatic. There is strong evidence that the counterterrorism powers sought by Clinton and by the Bush administration after 9-11 were desired by federal law enforcement mainly to go after the anti-globalization movement. Let's review just what was entailed in the traditional technique of open-mouth sabotage from the same wobbly pamphlet quoted above. Sometimes simply telling people the truth about what goes on at work can put a lot of pressure on the boss. Consumer industries like restaurants and packing plants are the most vulnerable. And again, as in the case of the good work strike, you'll be gaining the support of the public, whose patronage can make or break a business. Whistleblowing can be as simple as a face-to-face -face conversation with a customer, or it can be as dramatic as the PG&E engineer who revealed that the blueprints to the Diablo Canyon nuclear reactor had been reversed. Upton Sinclair's novel, The Jungle, blew the lid off the scandalous health standards and working conditions of the meatpacking industry when it was published earlier this century. Waiters can tell their restaurant clients about the various shortcuts and substitutions that go into creating the faux oat cuisine being served to them. Just as work to rule puts an end to the usual relaxation of standards, whistleblowing reveals it for all to know. The Internet has increased the potential for open-mouth sabotage by several orders of magnitude. The first really prominent example of the open mouth in the networked age was the so-called McLibel case, in which McDonald's used a slap lawsuit to suppress pamphleteers highly critical of their company. Even in the early days of the Internet, bad publicity over the trial and the defendant's savvy use of the trial as a platform drew far, far more negative attention to McDonald's than the pamphleteers could have done without the company's help. In 2004, the Sinclair Media and Diebold cases showed that in a world of BitTorrent and mirror sites, it was literally impossible to suppress information once it had been made public. As recounted by Yochai Benkler, Sinclair Media resorted to a slap lawsuit to stop a boycott campaign against their company, aimed at both shareholders and advertisers, over their airing of an anti-carry documentary by the Swift Boaters. Sinclair found the movement impossible to suppress, as the original campaign websites were mirrored faster than they could be shut down, and the value of their stock imploded. As also reported by Benkler, Diebold resorted to tactics much like those the RIAA uses against file sharers to shut down sites which published internal company documents about their voting machines. 
The memos were quickly distributed by BitTorrent to more hard drives than anybody could count, and Diebold found itself playing whack-a-mole as the mirror sites displaying the information proliferated exponentially. One of the most entertaining cases involved the MPAA's attempt to suppress DCSS, John Johansson's CSS descrambler for DVDs. The code was posted all over the blogosphere in a deliberate act of defiance and even printed on T-shirts. In the Alisher Uzmanov case, the blogosphere lined up in defense of Craig Murray, who exposed the corruption of post-Soviet Uzbek oligarch Uzmanov against the latter's attempts to suppress Murray's site. Finally, in the recent WikiLeaks case, a judge's order to disable the site didn't have any real impact on the availability of the bare documents. Because WikiLeaks operates sites like WikiLeaks.cx in other countries, the documents remained widely available both in the United States and abroad, and the effort to suppress access to them caused them to rocket across the Internet, drawing millions of hits on other websites. This is what's known as the Streisand effect. Attempts to suppress embarrassing information result in more negative publicity than the original information itself. The Streisand effect is displayed every time an employer fires a blogger, the phenomenon known as deucing after the first prominent example of it, over embarrassing comments about the workplace. The phenomenon has attracted considerable attention in the mainstream media. In most cases, employers who attempt to suppress embarrassing comments by disgruntled workers are blindsided by the much, much worse publicity resulting from the suppression attempt itself. Instead of a regular blog readership of a few hundred reading that Employer X sucks, the blogosphere or a wire service picks up the story and tens of millions of people read Blogger Fired for Revealing Employer X Sucks. It may take a while, but the bosses will eventually learn that for the first time since the rise of the large corporation in the broadcast culture, we can talk back. And not only is it absolutely impossible to shut us up, but we'll keep making more and more noise the more they try to do so. To grasp just how breathtaking the potential is for open-mouth sabotage and for networked anti-corporate resistance by consumers and workers, just consider the proliferation of anonymous EmployerNameSucks.com sites. The potential results from the anonymity of the writable web, the comparative ease of setting up anonymous sites through third-country proxy servers if necessary, and the possibility of simply emailing large volumes of embarrassing information to everyone you can think of whose knowledge might be embarrassing to an employer. Regarding this last, it's pretty easy to compile a devastating email distribution list with a little internet legwork. You might include the management of your company's suppliers, outlets, and other business clients, reporters who specialize in your industry, mainstream media outlets, alternative news outlets, worker and consumer advocacy groups, corporate watchdog organizations specializing in your industry, and the major bloggers who specialize in such news. If your problem is with the management of a local branch of a corporate chain, you might add to the distribution list all the community service organizations your bosses belong to and CC it to corporate headquarters to let them know just how much embarrassment your bosses have caused them. The next step is to set up a dedicated web-based email account accessed from someplace secure. Then it's pretty easy to compile a text file of all the dirt on their corruption and mismanagement and the poor quality of customer service, with management contact info, of course. The only thing left is to click Attach and then click Send. The barrage of emails, phone calls, and faxes should hit the management suite like an A-bomb. So what model will labor need to follow in the vacuum left by the near-total collapse of the Wagner regime and the near-total defeat of the establishment unions? Part of the answer lies with the wobbly, direct-action-on-the-job model discussed above. A great deal of it in particular lies with the application of open-mouth sabotage on a society-wide scale, as exemplified by cases like McLeibel, Sinclair, Diebold, and WikiLeaks described above. Another piece of the puzzle has been suggested by the IWW's Alexis Buss in her writing on minority unionism. If unionism is to become a movement again, we need to break out of the current model, one that has come to rely on a recipe increasingly difficult to prepare. A majority of workers vote a union in, a contract is bargained. We need to return to the sort of rank-and-file on-the-job agitating that won the eight-hour day and built unions as a vital force. Minority unionism happens on our own terms regardless of legal recognition. U.S. and Canadian labor relations regimes are set up on the premise that you need a majority of workers to have a union, generally government-certified in a worldwide context. This is a relatively rare setup. 
And even in North America, the notion that a union needs official recognition or majority status to have the right to represent its members is of relatively recent origin, thanks mostly to the choice of business unions to trade rank and file strength for legal maintenance of membership guarantees. The labor movement was not built through majority unionism. It couldn't have been. How are we going to get off this road? We must stop making gaining legal recognition and a contract the point of our organizing. We have to bring about a situation where the bosses, not the union, wants the contract. We need to create situations where bosses will offer us concessions to get our cooperation. Make them beg for it. But more than anything, the future is being worked out in the current practice of labor struggle itself. We're already seeing a series of prominent labor victories resulting from the networked resistance model. The Walmart Workers Association, although it doesn't have an NLRB certified local in a single Walmart store, is a de facto labor union, and it has achieved victories through associates picketing and pamphleting stories on their own time, through swarming via the strategic use of press releases and networking, and through the same sort of support network that Ron Felt and Arkea remarked on in the case of the Pro Zapatista campaign. By using negative publicity to embarrass the company, the association has repeatedly obtained concessions from Walmart. Even a conventional liberal like Ezra Klein understands the importance of such unconventional action. The coalition of Imilaki workers, a movement of Indian agricultural laborers who supply many of the tomatoes used by the fast food industry, has used a similar support network with the coordinated use of leaflets and picketing, petition drives, and boycotts to obtain major concessions from Taco Bell, McDonald's, Burger King, and KFC. Blogger Charles Johnson provides inspiring details. In another example of open mouth sabotage, the IWW affiliated Starbucks union publicly embarrassed Starbucks chairman Howard Schultz. It organized a mass email campaign notifying the board of a co op apartment he was seeking to buy into of his union busting activities. Such networked labor resistance is making inroads even in China, the capitalist motherland of sweatshop employers. Michael Bowens at P2P Blog quotes a story from the Taiwanese press. The factory closure last November was a scenario that has been repeated across southern China, where more than a thousand shoe factories, about a fifth of the total, have closed down in the past year. The majority were in Haozhou, a concrete sprawl on the outskirts of Dongguan known as China's shoe town. In the past, workers would just swallow all the insults and humiliation. Now they resist, said Jenny Chan, chief coordinator of the Hong Kong based pressure group Students and Scholars Against Corporate Misbehavior, which investigates factory conditions in southern China. They collect money and they gather signatures. They use the shop floors and the dormitories to gather the collective forces to put themselves in better negotiating positions with factory owners and managers, she said. Technology has made this possible. They use their mobile phones to receive news and send messages, Chan said. Internet cafes are very important, too. They exchange news about which cities or which factories are recruiting and what they are offering, and that news spreads very quickly. As a result, she says, factories are seeing huge turnover rates. In Haozhou, some factories have tripled workers' salaries, but there are still more than 100,000 vacancies. The AFL CIO's Lane Kirkland once suggested half heartedly that things would be easier if Congress repealed all labor laws and let labor and management go at it mano a mano. It's time to take this proposal seriously. So here it is a free market proposal to employers. We give you the repeal of Wagner, of the anti yellow dog provisions of Norris LaGuardia, of legal protections against punitive firing of union organizers, and of all the workplace safety, overtime, and fair practices legislation. You give us the repeal of Taft Hartley, the Railway Labor Relations Act, and its counterparts in other industries, of all state right to work laws, and of slap lawsuits. All we'll leave in place, out of the whole labor law regime, is the provisions of Norris LaGuardia taking intrusion by federal troops and court injunctions out of the equation. And we'll mop the floor with your asses. Should labor be paid or not? Benjamin R. Tucker, 1888. In number 121 of Liberty, criticizing an attempt of Kropotkin to identify communism and individualism, I charged him with ignoring the real question whether communism will permit the individual to labor independently, own tools, sell his labor or his products, and buy the labor or products of others. In Herr Most's eyes, this is so outrageous that, in reprinting it, he puts the words the labor of others in large black type. 
Most being a communist, he must, to be consistent, object to the purchase and sale of anything whatever, but why he should particularly object to the purchase and sale of labor is more than I can understand. Really, in the last analysis, labor is the only thing that has any title to be bought or sold. Is there any just basis of price except cost? And is there anything that costs except labor or suffering, another name for labor? Labor should be paid. Horrible, isn't it? Why, I thought the fact that it is not paid was the whole grievance. Unpaid labor has been the chief complaint of all socialists, and that labor should get its reward has been their chief contention. Suppose I had said to Kropotkin that the real question is whether communism will permit individuals to exchange their labor or products on their own terms. Would Herr Most have been so shocked? Would he have printed that in black type? Yet in another form I said precisely that. If the men who oppose wages, that is, the purchase and sale of labor, were capable of analyzing their thought and feelings, they would see that what really excites their anger is not the fact that labor is bought and sold, but the fact that one class of men are dependent for their living upon the sale of their labor, while another class of men are relieved of the necessity of labor by being legally privileged to sell something that is not labor, and that, but for the privilege, would be enjoyed by all gratuitously. And to such a state of things I am as much opposed as any one. But the minute you remove privilege, the class that now enjoys it will be forced to sell their labor, and then, when there will be nothing but labor with which to buy labor, the distinction between wage payers and wage receivers will be wiped out, and every man will be a laborer exchanging with fellow laborers. Not to abolish wages, but to make every man dependent upon wages and to secure to every man his whole wages is the aim of anarchistic socialism. What anarchistic socialism aims to abolish is usury. It does not want to deprive labor of its reward, it wants to deprive capital of its reward. It does not hold that labor should not be sold, it holds that capital should not be hired at usury. But, says Hermost, this idea of a free labor market from which privilege is eliminated is nothing but consistent Manchesterism. Well, what better can a man who professes anarchism want than that? For the principle of Manchesterism is liberty, and consistent Manchesterism is consistent adherence to liberty. The only inconsistency of the Manchester men lies in their infidelity to liberty in some of its phases, and this infidelity to liberty in some of its phases is precisely the fatal inconsistency of the Freeheit school, the only difference between its adherents and the Manchester men being that in many of the phases in which the latter are infidel, the former are faithful, while in many of those in which the latter are faithful, the former are infidel. Yes, genuine anarchism is consistent with Manchesterism, and communistic or pseudo-anarchism is inconsistent Manchesterism.